What's up, guys? Wall J here, and I'm here with my co-host. Heart of War. Across the table there, we got Matador Roja, Sherry Arnold. Uh, across the boards, producer Chris. Hello. And special guest, Bobby Thompson, owner Yee-yee. of Checkmate, and starting a new podcast, Jiu-Jitsu and Coffee. Yep, that's it. Ah, I'm so excited to hear this thing. You got two episodes down already. Yep. Beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about the podcast and kind of how you have it structured and what makes it maybe different than others? Yeah, so I'm still kind of finding my way. Yeah, I'm new to podcasts. Right now, uh, my goal is just to interview as many Jujitero in Jacksonville as possible and, and then, you know, kind of branch out. But uh, it's kind of to introduce people in the region or to the area to other Jujitero, uh, talk about their experience with Jiu-Jitsu, kind of like their their regimen, uh, diet, whatnot. Uh, and then I, I run everyone through the woke meter. So just to kind of be different because it's a passion of mine. The woke uh, meter. The woke what, meter. What is yeah. the woke meter? <laughs> Are you woke, son? Yeah. Woke son. <laughs> so uh, I'm into conspiracies. I love. I love conspiracies. So Robbie uh, any, any conspiracy. Yeah. You got to talk to this. I'm man. addicted. So so I just you know I run everyone through like the top fifteen, top ten or fifteen uh, government and uh, alien related whatever. Nice. You know. So that's it. And then we then we cap it off with just some like random jujitsu talk, whatever comes to mind. Alien related. So you're you're like into Area 51 and all that stuff. Roswell. Uh, I mean, I'm not not so much into those. Like, uh, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll, like, I'll watch stuff on that. But there's things that are more interesting to me. I'm like a huge fan of Zechariah Sitchin, who is, if you're familiar with Anunnaki, I'm like, I love, I'm really interested in listening to or learning about that. Um, or Graham Hancock. Uh, Lloyd Pye, there's all these really sharp guys out there, Stephen Greer, um, but anybody. I listen to people, I don't even know who they are. Um, megalithic structures blow my mind, you know. Uh, we, we can't create these things today. They're out there, and we, we can't make them. Like, Elon Musk couldn't make Saxe Juan. People don't understand that today, is that they, they go out there and look at it. That blows my mind. Like, how did that get here? If we can't, if we can't produce that today with all our money mm-hmm. and all our technology – how did that get there thousands of years and ago? And simple, simple building materials too. It's not like it's like some sort of complicated alien. Like like our buildings seem look and look very complicated, but they can't stand the test of time. Like something as simple as that and complicated. Huge stones, just huge stones with like sometimes twelve angles, thirteen angles, and they're every angle, every stone is different, and they're fit together perfectly that you can't get a razor blade between them. But also front to back, and these things are three feet thick. We can't. We could only do that with a CNC today. Yeah. And they want to say, like, you know, the mainstream archaeology will say, or historians will say, well, that was done with copper and hammers. Like, that's impossible. That's yeah. that's anyone, anyone who knows, who works with stone would tell you that's absolutely impossible. So you're thinking that, you know, like the Egyptian pyramids and all that, is that what we're talking about? It could be could be the the pyramids as well. Yeah, They're, those are have the same similar construction. We, the, the, the real crazy thing is we had the same type of construction going on all over the world. You know, it's in... It was in Asia. It was in uh, the Middle East. It was in South America. South America yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that 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 stuff just blows my mind. And there's other theories out there, like a, a whole other theory that that uh, completely captivates me is the thought that humanity is wiped out every so often, every five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand years. You know, it gets wiped out. And um, there was a guy named Emmanuel Velikovsky who, in ni- like around 1950, he re- he re- he uh, wrote a book called When Worlds Collide. And his theory is that humanity gets wiped out every every so often, not on a regular schedule. It could be 5,000 years, it could be 10,000, 50,000. And his proof for that is the moon. If you look at the moon, it's been hit so many times that there is no, you know, it's impact after impact after impact. Yeah. The problem is the, the moon has no atmosphere, so it shows all those craters. And some of these craters are 600 miles across. We talk about the devastation that would be done to Earth if – an asteroid the size of the Empire State Building hit. It would, it would just, it would, you know, decimate humanity. Yeah. And if, if, if we have 600 mile across asteroids flying through our solar system, which we do, the moon's proof of it, and we've been here 5 billion years and the moon's been hit more times than we can imagine, well, humanity's been wiped out again and again and again. That, that, it kind of is common sense. For me, like, I, I kind of agree with the theory. And if you, if you listen to his, um, you know, his, uh, uh, what's the word for it? drawing a blank on the word, you know, he, they, they, 
now he has kind of people he's passed on and there's people that kind of take his theory and run with it. So do you think it's something like this, right? So we have these ca- catastrophic events that happen to the earth and, and humanity is completely wiped out. Do you think there's just like a few little outliers or whatever that happen to survive that little bit, survive through that crazy, you yeah. know, of course they're dumb as shit. You know. how, how can you survive that though? Well, who knows, man? Maybe they're in small Caves pocket of the yeah. small pocket of the earth where it wasn't affected as much and they can just suck it up and survive through it and then like before you know they rebuild and, and you know it only took us how many years uh, not even a hundred years ago from like no TV to look at our computers yeah. now right. that's a hundred years well like racism and 60 70 years ago like people like had to drink out of different water fountains it's not that long ago yeah, this is like a generation now you're comparing Literally. like apples to oranges no 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 no, no. I'm just talking about no, no, no. What I'm saying is like technology wise. Yes, yes, yes. I'm using, I'm just saying, see how short of a distance it was. It goes from, <laughs> for change. You see how short of a time it is for cha- real change. Not even a hundred years. No TV, TV, crazy computers, 3D shit going on. I just hope I'm dead when the next Look, asteroid bro, hits. I can go I'm, onto my I'm phone right you. now and I can pull no, up fucking please, pictures please off your phone. and text messages. Oh my God. I can take pictures of you and I can send it all the way to Texas to my boy Robbie. Well, I'm going to do that right now. Listen, could you please get off your fucking phone? I'm making a point here. No, well, I can get you like it. my new case? I, I get it. No, do you it, like my new case? It looks like it's a girl's case. Dude, it's red. It's dope as shit. Should, I, I have a like, like case. My little dope. pony I agree. On it. It's a dope. It's oh, a dope case. See, he knows what I'm talking about. No, but he, about. he, he looks a little about. bit more manly than yours. Okay, whatever. <laughs> all I know is that I had a black case. I'd set it down. Couldn't find it. Got a red case. Set it down. Couldn't find it. That's one too. Your dog gets a hold of it. He's, he's at. Which dog? You know, there's one other thing that I got, I'd like to bring up is that if you think about this, if if we were decimated today, if an asteroid hit uh, Earth, no information we have would make it. I mean, how long would it take for? Um, first off, let's say you knew. Let's say you knew that in in one year we were going to hit by an asteroid. How would you save data? How would you save the knowledge that we have? We have no way to save it beyond. You know, floppy disks gone or, you know, CDs gone. Hard drives won't last that long. And mind you, we're not going to have electricity. We're not going to have – you're not going to have a way to save that information. We don't have a way to save information today. If you were decimated, even if you had these things, if you couldn't use them to copy them to others, which you wouldn't be able to, it's like, yeah, we know how to use a phone. We know how to drive a car, but we can't make a phone, can't make a car. Mm -hmm. The moment that infrastructure is gone – it just becomes lower, you know, three generations from now. Yeah, we used to be able to call someone on the other side of the planet. Dad's smoking crack again. He's on the marijuana, whatever. So how, how deep is the impact once it happens? Do we know? Well, as far as the impact, that doesn't really matter. It's more of the smoke well, and everything blocking the sun out of the sky. Well, you could you could store data in a sub and send it down. and Yeah, you know. but uh, sub needs fuel and how long would you know how long could you 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 need you need food delivered to it every so often to keep the staff going you need the infrastructure would be gone like if you really if you think it through there's no way and and let's think about this let's go back let's say fifty thousand years ago you know we've been here the the earth's arguably been here between four and five billion years um let's say let's say fifty thousand years ago there was a civilization that got wiped out all, let's say there were a million cars on the earth or I don't know, 10 million, whatever. They'd be gone. There'd be no trace of a car. No trace. You leave a car for 10,000 years, there, there won't be – it's dust. The, uh, everything, the engine block will disintegrate. I want to say the History Channel did some sort of like breakdown of like the time schedule of how everything would break down, how animals, yeah. domesticated animals would go wild and how – there would be no, actually no signs of civilization, period, no time. in a very short amount of time. 10,000 years? Yeah. That's nothing. Yeah. Makes me wonder, you know, let's say, uh, so that, how, let's say that happened like 50,000 years ago. Were they more advanced than we were at that point? Strong possibility. Because what did I say? Well, what, what happened in the last 100 years? Now imagine this. And this time's had by another 1,000 years of the advanced te- technology that we already have now. 1,000 years from now, let's say we're not all decimated. What kind of crazy shit we have then? We come to an understanding like, hey, listen, man, this is all going to end. Let's create something so maybe the next group will be able to – i.e. pyramids. Well, if they're all decimated, how does anybody come back? Small little pockets of people. Small little – a Small chicken and laid an egg, and then a man came out. Of well, it's, it's the, I mean, the theory is <laughs> that know. we don't all die off. Like right. some go underground. You know, we have bunkers or whatnot, and some some survive. Um, and then we go on to repopulate the earth, and then you know so that that's Emmanuel Velikovsky's theory. But lots of people have adopted that theory, and a lot of people don't know that he was one of the ones who popularized it. But uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. If you if you look at the moon, it's it's very likely if you just 
you know, look at the moon. The moon fascinates me. You know, an interesting thing about the moon is you hear the term the dark side of the moon, which I heard like my whole life. Transformers. But, yep. But a, I didn't know until a few <laughs> years ago that the, we never see the backside of the moon. It's locked in our, as, as the earth spins, it's locked in orbit. Like the odds of that happening are so minuscule. What are the odds that, that we, the, the moon doesn't spin? Like we never see the back of it. Never. It's, yeah. it's always the same side facing us as we like, what are the, it just stops spinning facing us. You know, that's crazy. On the backside, never knew that. It's a complete yeah. civilization yeah, that we true. don't know about. Some sort of like but crazy. It, you know, you, you, see now I'm thinking. Base. Now I'm thinking Transformers is based on a true story. No, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Though you have a redeeming quality. I really like your T-shirt, my friend. Uh, it's yeah, pretty dope. Who did the artwork? Uh, uh, some guy. We we uh so, so we 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 hashed out a bunch of different like logo ideas and so on and so forth and then uh we we came up with the the idea of trying to make it something that and by way he means him any anybody <laughs> anybody could wear it and it doesn't necessarily have to mean a jiu jitsu school it can be it could just be a logo a art of war without the jj jiu jitsu it could, it's just like sangsu you know what i mean it's it's just its own little brand and that uh, just happens to also be part of our, our school art of war jiu jitsu uh, a lot of those facts I, or a lot of those ways of thinking, I think, fits in jiu-jitsu as well. So uh, make it nice, clean, simple, easy design. We, uh, we we hashed over a whole bunch of things. We got this designer off of Instagram he, uh, after trying a couple other ones, and it just didn't work out. And I really liked how he took the AOW, the Art of War, and made it kind of look Chinese style of, of writing. Yeah, it's and dope. I'll... I'll... Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, so, it's pretty dope. Yeah, so we jumped on that. It was, so, it nice Brandon Colbert says, happy birthday, Bobby. Thank you. Happy birthday, Bobby. Thank you. Hey, hey, what, what, is, what is the other it's one? It's the 11th. Oh, it's yesterday. The 11th. Yeah. Wait, Related. what day is it today? It's not, I think today's the, no, today's the 12th, right? Yes, the 12th oh, was yesterday. Happy birthday. Thank and, you. And, and he has some dumb, some dumb uh, comment. He oh. said, if the moon was made out of barbecue, it would be a spare ribs and he would eat you. I don't know what that means. Uh, it's deep. Uh, let me, it's deep. Let me, let me, let me it's super deep. If the moon was made of barbecue, spare ribs would eat would eat it. I don't know what you mean, so I'm a, I'm gonna you know I'm Brandon, gonna pass on it. Brandon, Brandon is an interesting guy, bro. Uh, are you I, high? I can't always follow his train of thought, but uh, <laughs> I love him all the same. <laughs> I think he's Brandon's a good dude. Who's got to hang out with Brandon? Raise your hand. I uh, like him. I like him. He's just a good, just a good dude. He's I like his hair now, though. I he, like his hair longer. Does he have the man bun going? Yes, sometimes he pulls in the man bun. But let me tell you why he does this, right? So his mother has, um, you know, has cancer. And uh, so he grows his hair out. He's growing it not to a certain length. He's going to cut it off so that way she can have, have his hair. Um, so, like, like this, this oh, guy, awesome. he's, just a, he's just a good dude. You know what I mean? He's funny. He's fun to hang out with. I don't know about funny. He I might, think he's, he's funny. funny looking. He's he's funny. He's a funny dude. He's a good he's a good hearted dude, man. So like you know, like just little things like that he does. He does a bunch of bunch of things like that. I mean, he'll never he he doesn't tell people this stuff, but I I know because I hang out with him a lot. So why are you putting his business out there? Well, <laughs> just that one bit. I just want, I, I I just want to highlight. Maybe I just want to highlight my friend. Let people know that maybe he's a he good wanted dude. to keep that to himself. Nah, it's fine. I'm his friend. I can say that. <laughs> right, Brandon? You just put you just put a thumbs up down there and we'll let everybody know. He said, Art, please don't tell my stuff online. See? Yeah, that's not how you write. That's how Wallow broken English <laughs> speaks. So, Bobby, some things that people don't know about you. One, that you started a podcast, so we're kind of help promoting that. And, um, and, and it's big in the jiu-jitsu community. I, I, and he's I, a black belt. And he's a black belt for sure. And we definitely want to go into kind of your history and, and your thinkings of you, for yourself as far as jujitsu and how it affects you. But um, where was I going? Because you just ruined that for me. You just ruined that for me. Let's just jump onto that. Tell us a little bit of your history of like why you started jujitsu, how it's kind of like your thoughts about it has maybe evolved over time and, and what brings you up to today. Uh, yeah, I, I think I got in the same reason we all did. I hope so. Uh, Hoist Gracie, man. I wasn't into any sports. Uh, in 93, I was watching. I watched Hoist beat up all these dudes, and I was just like, damn, that works. Because uh, I had started to take other martial arts. I took Taekwondo, and I wasn't sold on it. Like, I, yeah. I, did, I didn't feel like – I didn't get confidence. Like, I could kick someone's ass. I was, I was like, the this. same thing. I was like, you can't punch him in the head? Well, it's just – it wasn't convincing to me. I was <laughs> like uh, – 
I got in a fight with this black belt, and uh, granted, I fought dirty. I smacked him in the face with a food tray, but but I won the fight. You know, and I was yeah. like, well, where'd that Taekwondo go? It wasn't, it wasn't really. You won prison but, rules on him. It was prison rules. But, <laughs> Nonetheless, I was like, uh, I just wasn't convinced. Like when I took Taekwondo, I just wasn't, you know, they had us standing up doing these, this, you know, this, and I'm like, I'm going to do this in a fight. Whatever that is, that stupid thing. I don't know. Yeah. Nobody ever questions that. Nobody ever questions that. They don't. It didn't seem real to me. So when I saw Hoist beating all these dudes asses, I was like, man, that is dope. And then the very first day, I remember I was, I was working out in the gym and I'm like, well, that's like some secret art. You can't learn it. And I'm in Jacksonville in 2002 and this, I see this dude with a Hoist Gracie shirt and I walk up and I'm like, dude, that shirt is fucking dope. And he's like, man, they're opening a school. So he told me where it was. I was the first student, first, the day it opened, January 1st, 2003. I was there. I was the, it was like two or three of us and I never, it was five days a week since then. I've, ne- I've never taken a break. I've just been thoroughly addicted. So uh, 15 and a half years now. Yeah. So who school. do you start with? What's that? Who? What, when did you start? I what started year? January 1st, 2000. Well, I, technically, I started in like December. I started because he was kind of teaching out of Alex Limbaugh's school. So I went and trained at Alex's school. Larry hadn't, didn't officially open the school yet. So technically, I started in December of 2002. But, um, You're talking about Larry Sheely? Larry Sheely, yeah. yeah. Okay. At the time, what I didn't know was that Lionel Perez was teaching. And he had a few guys. It was small. It was kind of like this. Lionel Perez was one of the originals here. Yeah. He's it, over in Key West now, right? Yeah. 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 Lionel, with Lionel, is like this, this uh, well, here's the thing. It was a small group of them. A lot of people don't know before Larry opened up his school in 2003, in 1995, he, right after he saw Hoist fight, he flew to California and started taking lessons. He was flying back and sharing that. And he got a group together. And part of that group was Lionel Perez and Thomas Strickland and Brett Hicks. And, and there was, he, he, he started the original group and his knees were, he, the guy had bad, bad knees. He was a little bit older he had some knee surgeries, kind of quit training, and Lionel and those guys, as this is as I understand the story, um, they they kept on doing their thing. Well, I never knew about them. They they weren't doing any advertising, any marketing. They just they had a small group that were doing their own thing. But the first time I heard about a school, uh, man, I was there. I was part of it. Yeah. And uh had some good dudes. Thomas Strickland started training there, Brett Hicks started training there. Um, and they were blue belts already and in, in, when I started training and they, you know, they were going down and cross training with uh Oh, Gracie Orlando. I can't remember his name, uh, the, the owner of it. Uh, but he used to put on the IBJJF worlds here because they used to be on the East coast. Oh yeah. Um, his name will come to me after it's not relevant. But... <laughs> so that goes. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's it, man. And, uh, I never looked back a little, but the interesting thing is it appealed to me cause I was skinny, man. I was, I actually graduated high school 6'4", 135. Like, that's an wow. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. like, that's, that's like, that's insane. And, I, you that's know, I've healthy. known you for quite a long time, and I've never seen you overweight. You've always been a thin build and always been a tall dude, yeah. too. Yeah, and that's, that's honestly, I don't have to do much for it. It's just, it's like, I, I try to put on weight. That's a it's constant that struggle. that ectomorphic body style, even. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so when I saw what Hoist could do, I was like, man, I can do that. Like, all of a sudden, uh, yeah, I was down. Um but what's changed? Here's the interesting thing about jujitsu today is that today it's a sport, mm-hmm. and every every school you go to has this um, you know 30 minutes of calisthenics, and I don't think that was Alio's intention. Mm-hmm. Uh, By the way, I don't like that. Continue. I don't agree. I continue just, personally. I don't agree with it. I I didn't sign up for that. Like I signed up for self defense, right. and I don't think Alio was having people doing burpees and alligator crawls and all this. So what ha- I never wanted to teach. I never wanted to own a school. I had a successful business at the time. I was, and uh, I tried a whole bunch of schools out, and all these schools had these crazy exercises that I just didn't want to do. I I just wanted to learn self defense. Yeah. So out of necessity, I started my own school, and I just started doing what I, what I call technique centric training. I I never did calisthenics. We don't do it. All I do is stretch for seven eight minutes, and then we do like. 50 minutes of technique. I, I get a minimum of eight moves, sometimes 15 moves. Mm-hmm. So in the course of a year, you know, the people who train with me are going, we're, we're covering 400 moves and have fairly good, you know, fairly good, uh, pace there. Yeah. 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 So I, that, I, I don't enjoy that. You know, when, when you're doing 20 minutes of got to do push ups and jumping jacks well, and all that, I just want to stretch and, and let's go. Let's I have, show me I what I my, need. I have my take on that as well. Go and ahead coming up and I've been to a bunch of different schools and I've owned a couple of schools myself. Um, I was that guy who was 30 minutes of hard because that's hard work, right? You're showing good jujitsu. You're doing, 
your drills, you know, that's bullshit. And then I realized, you know, especially when you start owning a school, like you'll get your guys to show up one to maybe two days a week. If you're doing it like that, yep. you, their bodies won't hold on. They, they can't do it. They're not learning as much. They're not getting as much actual real mat time doing technique. So what I find is, is you warm them up through the technique. So you have them do the technique, but you do a slow and nice and methodical and you kind of warm them up through it. This is the way I'm thinking now. And then also before, uh, depending on what school you are, it might be a smash mouth school. They show one or two moves and then you're rolling for 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Yeah. And I feel that's lazy. I feel that's a lazy way of teaching because then you don't really have to think about a whole lot. You're like, uh, this, this week we're going to go over, uh, Comores. You show a couple of different core entries and then boom, let them roll. I teach to the smartest guy, not, not the, not the lowest, right? Yes. I teach to the smartest guy and you retain whatever you can retain. You know, um, we, we do, an, uh, an hour of technique and an hour of sparring. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it goes to an hour and a half, whatever we're there at minimum of two hours for, yeah. for the class. Um, I, yeah. I, I like that. I think that's good. And as far as like the sparring goes, you know, I, I, I like splitting it up between not just an hour of just open sparring, but like put them through positional stuff. So that way they get those reps in those positions that maybe they may not hit all the time. Like maybe one guy's really strong athletic dude. He doesn't get put in bottom side control. So and, you put him in positional sparring five minutes, one guy on top, no matter what, you got to escape that side control right? yeah. and then you switch it. So, and, and another thing is when, when you run a school, like the way you're talking, like you sounds like you're starting, like sounds like people are starting to reconsider is then jujitsu is for everybody. Yes. Right. And yes. that, that's been my thing from the get go. I was the weak guy, right? Like I was, I was the least athletic guy in my group. I, I can safely say that. I, I can't think of anyone less athletic than me. The farthest I've ever ran in my life is a mile and a half. And only because they made me in the Air Force. Like, I barely made that. <laughs> yeah. um, I've never done wind sprints or anything like that. I, have, I can't squat my – I can't squat – I could barely squat a bar, you know, my biggest part of my legs and my knees. But uh, jujitsu should be for everybody, right? And I think anyone can be proficient with it. You just learn how to use your assets of your body. Um, yeah. And then I do one other thing differently. And I'm honestly, I'm reconsidering this today, but not – for different reasons than you would think is for the last, you know, 13 years since I've been, since I've been teaching, I started teaching as a two stripe blue belt. Um, I've always done untimed matches. We don't switch until there's a submission. So it's like, um, and then it, you may want to go again. So sometimes a match may go 40 minutes if you're going against someone good. But what I believe is that changes the type of sparring you're going to do. If you, if you go a five minute match and switch five, one guy will take the mentality. Well, I'm going to try to survive. But if the match isn't over until someone lose, now this guy has to try to win. And that changes the way that, that changes everything. The way, the way you spar now survival's out the door, or you could take a self-defense style. Like, well, I'm going to look for an opportunity. I'm going to survive and wait for this opportunity. But sometimes we have matches go 40 minutes, but I, I, there's only one downside to that. And is if you don't switch every five minutes, what happens is certain people in the school gravitate to each other. And you, you, you see these little pairs, right? Where it's yeah. like this. And what you don't realize is you're ostracizing. And this is a, this is actually like a this week realization for me, even though I prefer that style of training, you're ostracizing people. And now these people, they don't feel like, like well, let's see, for example, and I don't know, I don't I haven't trained with you guys recently. But let's say you two always spar. Let's just say that happens. And then let's say someone new comes in and they, they, they just don't feel part of that circle because every time it's sparring time, well, it's always Art and Sherry, right? Yeah, they're, they're not, not rotating. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I think the five minutes does have that advantage. And I may start swapping. I may start going one night, five minutes, one night on time sparring. It's like going into um, like a tournament. You know, you have a time setting versus a sub only. Your mindset is completely different. And you're like, okay, I don't have to rush in. I don't have to get the take. I don't have to do this. Yeah. Take my time, and, and it's just a different mindset. Yeah. It, you know what? I agree with both of you guys. And I like I like the idea of changing it up and just making it different. One, people feel stale. It's like, all right, I know it's going to be an hour of technique, whatever it is. We're, we're going to drill the shit out of it, and then we're going to roll, and it's going to be positional for this, and you know, my, just five-minute rounds. And sometimes you need to have different kind of mindsets depending on what you're, what you're going to be doing. If it's a, it's a street or a self-defense situation, you know what I mean? You have to, you, you can open up the time. If, if you've got guys training for uh, specific matches, you know, say tournaments, competition, whatever, they need to know what their time is in that tournament and start to make stuff happen. You know, if it's point tournament, submission only tournament, MMA, 
match, um, you know, you, you kind of have to tailor that to the person. And, and tell me what you think about this. This is my thinking of it. And maybe you agree, maybe you don't. And I actually look up to you a whole lot. So when you say something, I might I might even change the way I think maybe a little bit if it's different. Um, I, ta- I tailor the training not to just one group of people. I, tra- I tailor it to each individual person. You're like, but how can you do that in a class? I'm like, well, this person wants com- – this group of people want competition. This group of people want it for fitness. This group of people are doing it recreational. This group of people will do it for self-defense. Uh, when I set up the class, and especially when it comes to the positional, when it comes to the, the individual part, I have different expectations to each one of those guys. Uh, the, my competition guys, I better see them continually drilling, and I will get on them because they told me in the beginning when they signed up, I want to do competitions. I have it written on the paper. I have notes on all my guys. He wants competition. He doesn't want competition. I got to treat him different. This person wants self-defense. I'm going to really hone in on their self-defense and not necessarily care if they're repping it out a billion times like these competition guys who are wanting something specific or some guys that want fitness. And maybe I won't be as critical on their tech, although I'm pretty mm-hmm. critical. Um, I just want them moving, you know, or maybe I put them into a different portion of the class. How do you feel about that? And do you do you have that same kind of thinking or, or how do you how do you treat that? No, I don't. Um... That's interesting. Like I'm listening to that and I'm like, that's, that's, that's interesting. I didn't, I never thought about, I never, you know, just the expectations for each person and I treat them per those, ex, per the expectations of what they told me. Yeah. I, I run mine like, like a Gracie Academy, essentially like a Gracie Academy that went rogue. And I'll explain what I mean in a second. <laughs> um, because I want it to be for everyone. So yeah. I run mine self-defense oriented because mm-hmm. I want, I want anyone to be able to come in and train it. It can be a 50 year old man, a 60 year old man, a 30, you know, a woman, I don't want anyone, and I never push competitions. I never mention them. People send me crap all the time. I just sit on the table. I don't push competition because uh, I think you can lose someone like that. I think some people think are so pushed right. into competitions that aren't really ready. Uh, a lot of times I'll compete, and I won't even tell my students I'm going to compete. I'll just, you know, they'll be like, oh, damn, you didn't say anything. I'm like, I do it for me if I'm going to do it. Yeah. Um, but when I say rogue is, um, even though I'm, a you know, a thousand percent into the self-defense, you know, I'm sold on it. I fell in love with leg attacks. I fell in love with Eddie's system. Um, I believe that, you know, the Jeet the, the, uh, Kundo mentality, you know, Bruce Lee's mentality is just take everything and keep what works. There's parts of Eddie's system that work real well for me. Yeah. And there's parts of, um, you know, there's parts of Sambo that work real well for me. And I don't, I got into an argument with this guy. It was, man, this dude's got like a, a, a good following. Someone tagged me in a post on Facebook. And I didn't know who the guy was at the time. The guy's name is Henry Akins. All right. He's, uh, I think that's his name. Rondo's uh, ex uh, coach. Well, he's a black belt under Hickson. Right. And he teaches not invisible jiu jitsu. He calls it transparent jiu jitsu. I guess Hickson got on him or something. I don't know. Um, but this, the, this is the most ironic thing I'd ever seen. On his, someone had tagged me in it on his Facebook page. And it had this video of this kid getting in a fight on a basketball court. Oh, I know. That. And he heel hooked the dude. Yeah. Right? I know yeah. that one. And what he had put for the top is, you know, you can't use heel hooks in a street fight. <laughs> Why not? Well, really? well, hold on. I'm like, well, he, did, he did that for, and I'm like, I kind of replied back. I'm like, this is the most ironic post that I've ever seen. The guy just won a fight with a heel, just won a street fight with a heel hook, and you're saying <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, that was all I said. I'm right. like, I mean, you're posting evidence that it does, but saying contrary. And he's like, the guy gets on. I'm sure he's very confident. I'm a black belt. He's a black belt. Um, and he says, uh, you know, I said, the guy, he says something like, well, well, it won't work, you know, it won't work in a street fight situation. I said, that, was that not a street fight situation? Did the dude just not get in a fight? And he goes, so he kind of like, directed at me personally. He goes, well, I'd like to see you heel hook me from mount, you know, when I'm mounted on top of you. And I said, I, I can, no problem. And he goes, you can't heel hook someone when you're, you know, he replies back. You can't heel hook someone when they're so mounted on top of you. on how you do it. Ha, ha, ha. I do it all the well, time. I'm like, <laughs> so do I. Bro, bro he, hip heist, push out. Like comes over, yeah. go right to Ashi and boom, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, you can. You yeah. can heel hook people from anywhere, like anywhere. anywhere. People don't realize this. From like, guard, from well, even you even even one. Eddie Bravo will tell you he doesn't like being on on, on mount now because guys can heel hook him. Yeah, so, I don't. I don't. Come I, on. Uh, there's a very specific way that I show my guys mount. It, it, it's funny. Jiu-Jitsu is very much an arms race. It's what's hot right now. So like the, I think the coach's like job at this point in time, especially when it comes to competition portion of this, 
is to see what's hot and see how you counteract that. So, like, just know that, like, yeah, heel hooks and all that stuff are very, very hot right now, leg locking system, because it defies what no- typical jujitsu is, you know? Like, and I think John Danaher definitely, uh. You mean millionaire this, John this, Danaher now? What? What? Millionaire John Danaher. Whatever. Well, what does I that think- mean? Have you have you seen the numbers from what they're projecting his uh, yeah. his leg lock attack? I don't really care about that, but what I what I do know is that. But I just asked him. Let him finish. It's okay. No, it's okay. Well, well, I mean, I good. was in the middle of something, but yeah, that's cool. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are we are we cool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we just went off version. You know, if, if we do that you, too long, I forget what I'm talking about. Ah, okay, go ahead. Continue yeah. before I you totally forget. forget what I thought, what I'm talking about. <laughs> go ahead, talk about John Danaher's fucking million dollar fucking leg. No, actually, system. I was going to go back because I think the uh, street fight you were talking about was that the one that happened in the gymnasium? Yeah, the fucking indoor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dude told him he said, "Man, said, fucking stop, get I'm off of me, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you'll never play basketball yeah. again." Yeah, it's legit it, as could be, bro. So yeah, I legit. That. I got a question for you from uh, people that are watching: gi or no gi? Both. 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 I, yeah. I, I, I got to be honest. I'm completely comfortable either way you come to my school and you want no gi we go no gi you, you want to go gi my last competition my you know, i did a super fight no gi i don't mind bro like i i used to be gi i used to love gi and uh took it off and i didn't like it at first i was like god you know you know i was conditioned that gi's the way you train kind of grew on me you know it's like i just feel loose you know you can move you know, it's not so i think that the gi I still agree with the argument that gi can make you better. It can make, it makes you more technical. You you can't slide out of things. You have to use technique. You can't just, you can't just bust out using, using Slippery, sweat, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like if I want to get out of, I got to know how to frame exactly right. I got to know where to hook my, I got to know where how to build leverage and pry something apart. And then now when we're no gi, I can use those same principles against you. It might be slippery, but I might be able to pull it off. It's like, I think there's an advantage there. I think historically the best no gi grapplers were actually champion gi grapplers. I think you got to do both. Boom, there you have it, Brian. I think that 50-50 is, is right. And, and I was only gi, and then I went no gi because I specifically wanted to do MMA, right? So I had to play in that in that thing. And then, of course, you know, my history with 10 Planet. And then after I left them, and I kind of went back into the gi, and I was kind of like, hmm, you know what? That Dirty Cousin, it's fun to play. It's fun to play again. Well, there's a bunch of different little little texts that I can, that I can and, do that I wasn't thinking. And I remember our last role that we had when I was Purple Belt. Um, I was mostly doing only no gi and I came to your school and we're doing gi and then something as simple as like the, uh, the baby white pass, you know what I mean? That, that high, high step pass and you did something to me that I'd never seen before and just kept me stacked right there and I couldn't do anything, but I also couldn't breathe. Yeah. So I was like, what do I do? I was like, I can't do anything. I mean, I have to yeah. tap. You yeah. know what I mean? Just Cause fold them at so the long. neck. It was like, that's what I always love doing was, that. It was beautiful. And yeah. it's so funny because I have you here on this podcast today. And I did, I did that technique, no gi version, but the same, did the same exact thing just this last week. And I was like, it was just had a little, small little flashback of you doing that to me. And I was it's like, funny because oh. I, I was there for that, that day. Yeah. yeah. That you were training with him. We, that, we, that, that's the day that Stewie put me to sleep. Stewie, oh, dang, bro. Man. Stewie's <laughs> such a beast, bro. That's not, he's, he's from another planet, man. He, he lived with, he lived in my school for like yeah. six months and I, he taught classes and we trained. I got to, yeah. we rolled together. Every other day. I could roll with him every day. I'd be crippled. No, no. He's just too too much. Well, not only is he technically sound, but he's a monster. I'm sorry. He's just a monster of a dude. But, you know, I want to go back and give you some props because you came into my gym that day and and, and uh, we, 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 we trained together a few times, you know, and uh, I've always uh, thought you were a super cool dude, but uh, you hit me with a... Boy, were you wrong. You hit me with a leg, uh, a knee bar from side control. I love this series. I had forgot about it, actually. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. and you let go. And I know, I know for a fact you let go out of, out of, you know, whether it was respect or whatever it was, but you could have subbed me with it and you kind of chose not to. I think it was because like you was in my school or whatnot, but, um, I just want to say that was like super respectful. I thought you were a super respectful dude. And I thought that that's cool. We need more people like that Thanks, in jujitsu. Appreciate that. But, um, I worked on that series. Like as soon as you left, I was like, Did crap, you? I forgot about that. And I know you know what I'm talking about when you're in yeah. side control and you step over and hook that leg. And I was yeah. like, oh shit, you yeah. let go. And I'm like. Yeah, you had that solid. Well, when we, when we started doing leg locks, we, we had to do it because a lot of people spin the wrong way. And if they do, they're going to blow up their own knee. We just, their own we just let yeah. go. Yeah. It's like, man, I, I'd rather keep going and you ha- yeah. still have your leg. Oh, that was the one he had me in, though. Yeah. Like, it, it wasn't going to hurt me. He just had me in a, in a straight up knee bar. He could have just kept the pressure on. He didn't. But... 
Yeah. And, and you know what? That's always kind of a funny, funny thing too, right? When you go into another school and you're rolling with like their instructor or whatever and there's other students around, you're like, you know, oh, the question is, is always to you, do you do 100% of what you can do or do you like roll chill? And how I feel about it is, uh, first off, Bobby's a badass, okay, just so you know. Um, and he, he, you have taught me many things over the brief amount of times that we've trained together. I still use that shit today. Those, that knee slice from Del Hiva, pfft, yeah. I use it all the time. Yeah. I actually just showed it again this last week. I didn't, no you know, lie. You know what's funny is I was in uh, – I went to – competed last year in Zurich, Switzerland. And yeah. uh, I, I was in the, in the black belt division, you know, and I, and I hit that twice. Did uh, you really? Now, here's the thing. The guy, the guy didn't tap. But I, I, I felt his knee pull apart. The guy just didn't want to tap. But afterwards, I talked to him. I said, dude, how did you not tap that? He goes, bro, I'm not going to be training for a month. He goes, you you straight up ruined my knee. And I'm like, why didn't you tap? He's like, I, I just I wanted that medal. You know, it's like, oh, boy. but yeah, I, I felt his knee just separate, man. But it was, it was cool. I, um, how much was that medal? So I would have tapped. I, I gotta be honest. Tapped. I mean, the medal I cost at least a hundred and something dollars. <laughs> that medal, the medal, a hundred bucks. Maybe. Maybe if he was a I good mean, one. Maybe. Yeah. And your uh, knee, you Bobby. Know? You didn't. You didn't teach Art knee on belly, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a big knee on belly okay. fan until recently. Because I was gonna say, because if you did, I'm gonna ask you to leave. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> that's that's been a new a new uh, you know improvement to my he game. Kill, really... He kills us with that knee on belly. He likes well, surfboards hey, us. He kills you. He kills me. Well, everybody kills me. He everybody kills, kills me. me. I've learned how to deal with it and get a little better. I roll. But I roll. I'll give him my everybody. bag before I let him go. Well, I haven't <laughs> rolled with you in like a year. I think uh, everybody has their own little signature. You know, if if we go back, though, one of the things we, we were touching on, we said gi versus no gi. One oh, yeah. of the things that we didn't touch about is the benefit to training in the gi. There is one solid benefit to training in the gi that you don't develop no gi is that in a street fight, we have clothes on. Yeah. And we yeah. may even have a jacket on. Yeah. We're prop may have pants on and if you're i mean, I mean and, and we look at it a little bit differently because we're in florida but what happens when you live in kentucky or even yeah. north of that minneapolis sure. minnesota, minnesota now sure. more so than not yeah. you've essentially got a gi on right yeah. but we live in a place where you could have the equivalent of a gi on but yeah. we're at the bottom of the united states the second you go up a little bit just you know a couple hundred miles now half the year people are essentially walking around in gis got their windbreaker and you can just wreck some hoodie with, dude, I can't tell you how many cross tokes I've got. I could never count them all. And I you could get it with a t-shirt on. With a t-shirt. Absolutely. Yeah. You can. So it's like, those are things that would help you in a street fight that you've, you haven't perfected if you're not training in a game. Yep. I never I, understood the whole argument. It, well, it, I like it both. But. I always thought it was a tired argument only because of this. I was like, play what you like to play. Who cares? I I'm prefer not saying no which one gi, is better versus but, which one is not better. You know, I see. I, I, see I prefer no gi only because, well, one, we live in Florida. It's hot as shit. You got a hot potato <laughs> sack on you. It is what it is. But I also enjoy playing the gi because it has different different techs that I like. I my game for the gi is definitely different than my game with no gi. It's different. It's just different. Like my grips are different. How I go to attack. How I set things up is different. What, what at, attacks? Well, you like, got handles. No, no gi. No gi. Uh, Darces, jab ties, all those th options are open to me. Gi, it's not so much. You have to use different kind of tech. For me, I now, can't get my arms sliding in. There's too much damn friction. Now, I think uh, I will say this: as as you start getting older, though, uh, the gi is more friendly to yeah. older people because I can't go. As you get older, you can't go this full. Like I get a D1 wrestler come in with no gi. Yeah. Oh shit, that's a workout. Can't hold them, oh my can't god. Grip them, yeah. Well, it's so much speed. I can't. It's like. That speed and muscle for me is gone. Yeah. But now you put on a gi and it just turned into a chess match, like a solid chess match. And yeah. th that's more enjoyable, you know. That's uh, that's me. That's why I like gi. Yeah. So as you get older. Well, I, I feel because no gi for me, I'm, you know, I'm only in jiu-jitsu now going on a year and a half. So the speed of no gi kills me. You know, I'm 40 years old. You know, I'm a heavy guy. I don't have the speed going against a lot of these kids in the gym. In gi... You know, I've, I've been in construction my whole life. I got, you know, pretty good grips. I feel like I can grab everything. I can slow this yeah. whole thing down. Just chill out for a little bit. Let me catch my breath, you know. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> breath. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. I mean, and again, I like both. I, I'm not I'm not even in the argument because there's no argument. I, I like, I, I think yeah, they're I both great, great uh, arts. But uh, 
there's advantages to both, you know. But but definitely as as you get older, I think you'll see that you know kind of gi is more friendly. It's just a friendlier art to to the practitioner. Yeah. How do you feel about with kids? Do you start because most all kids programs they all start gi. I like gi's for kids, not because uh, I I do I do a no gi for my kids as well. So I I'm the same with the adults as I am with the kids. Um, one day a week is no gi. Um, and that's probably just because of my heritage, you know, just, I, you know, 11 years of my journey was in Hoist's system and it was gi. Everything was, you know, it was yeah. just, you know, 99% of what we did was gi. So it's what I'm used to. I know, I kind of know more in the gi or, um, so it, I think that's just a matter of like the pedigree or the heritage there, you know? So, but I don't know that, uh, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. No, I. You know, even the instructor that I'm underneath now, he he's definitely a big proponent of, of gi. the gi, and he's telling me, he's like, oh. I was like, hey, uh, you know, Jonathan, you know, I I, prim- I primarily know gi, that's so why I like. He's like, yeah, that's okay, Arthur, it's okay. You uh, but you're gonna put the gi on. It's cool. You're gonna get learn the power of the gi. <laughs> and he shows me his knuckles. Look, you got baby back rib hands. Your hands are weak. Yeah, well, you know, you know get stronger. What's oh, interesting is uh, 160 pound dude tooling me up. Stupid. I don't fight grips. I have no arthritic problems, and, and I think I should, if anyone should, for training, you know, five days a week for going on 16 years, is I don't mm-hmm. grip fight. Yeah. It, the the moment, what, I, what I've what i started doing is, if you grab my hand, I let go. But then the moment you let go, I re-grab. And that's, yeah. like, so I'm not, like, instead, like, what 99% of people do is you got to rip that off. And then this is, like, it's, like, pulling your hand. That's, like, that's, that's causing problems. Yeah. So what I've adopted is, and it's become incredibly uh, streamlined. You know, it's very effective is... If you grab, if I feel your hand come onto my, I just let go. So now you, you're going to let go, but I'm going to go back. And then it's like, that's incredibly frustrating for them. Cause then they're like, you know, stuck in a loop. Which one is it? Yeah. I like yeah, that. Exactly. I might try that. That's yeah. what I do. I don't, I don't. Grip I was going to say, because so, I, yeah, my fingers not, your hands, your forearms fighting. are blowing out before yeah. you know, I mean, you just, you just I don't, I don't grip pain. That's one, that's one thing that I don't like is that the grip fighting and trying to get somebody's hand off your lapel or what, or, you know, or and I think sleeve. there's. There's another method you can go is just don't have the fight. Just let go. And then the yeah. moment they like, re-grab, that's what I do. Yeah. I can play with that. I try to do. Yeah. That, that'll, that'll save this because this knuckle oh, on this middle finger is, is Last time I did gi, I was like this going yeah. home. <laughs> I was driving like yeah. this. <laughs> my, my fingers just hurt so bad. Tough situation. Yeah. yeah. I have to tape that one up. Not not to change subjects again, but how often are you looking to do your your podcast? Are are you trying to do it just once a week? Are you are you going to be doing it all throughout the week, or it just depends on how you schedule? So that Um, way, people can kind of know when to follow you and which platforms you're going to be on. I haven't been a podcast fan up until now. I'm like the busiest person in the world. I've I've got something going on. The moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, but uh, and I haven't listened to a whole lot, honestly. So I'm kind of like for me pioneering new ground. I really don't know what I'm doing. But I know I'm going to be consistent, and just so I can safely be consistent, I'm going to do uh, my interviews once a week. So I, I want to line up. Obviously, I'm catering to the jiu-jitsu community, and I'm catering to higher belts. But I will let anyone on if they like jiu-jitsu. I, I don't. I don't care who they are. Just come on my show, man. We're going to have a good time, just like just like here. Yeah, yeah. We're just going to talk jiu-jitsu, and I'm going to let I'm going to let anyone who's into t- tuned into the show get to know you and 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 outside of jujitsu i want to talk about your routine what you like i'll even ask like what's your favorite movie what kind of tv show like i want if you come on my show i want people to know who is walla like outside of jujitsu as well i want them to know who you are i'm a very private person thank you (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's like one of those things where jujitsu actually doesn't really just define that person and i think a lot of people feel that way jujitsu just defines them like that's oh, a, I'm a jiu-jitsu brown belt. That's yeah. all there is to me. I I, I I see people that all they have is jiu-jitsu and they have nothing else going on. It's like, I, I love I love jiu-jitsu, but it does not make the person that I am. It's part of me. Yeah, strong but part it, of me. But it, it does not me, make but... who I am. No, I got, too, it, many I got too many things going on that, that make me who I am, you know? So, yeah. I, you know, the, I, I think that that's a stage of growth. Because we went through that, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, if, if you're, we, I went through that stage, those years where jujitsu did define me and it's all I cared about. And I was just, you know, the clothing, the, you know, the, the, whatever it was, everything I did, my, my vacations, it was all based around jujitsu. And today it's a part of my life, but it didn't define me. I think I'm, it, it, I don't think it was ever, in, the intention wasn't to take over your life, right? It was, right. it's for self-defense. Yeah. So it's a huge passion and I love it, but I, I think there are much more, um, 
there's things way more things that I'm more passionate about than jujitsu. I think it's a, it's a good it's a good vehicle to get you to where you need to be, uh, ego wise, mental mentality wise, so on and so forth. And so like, you know, everybody every business has their motto, right? And and, and the mind, what I think is the most important part about it is to improve your life using jujitsu, using jujitsu to improve your life. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like so whatever may that may be, maybe it's your work and become a better person. Yeah. Um, somebody pisses you off at work. Hey man, you don't have the angst anymore. You know why? Cause you go to training tonight. You know, that's good. You well, know, you, you also to, know what you, you to prove yourself. Yeah. You also know what you can do to that person. Yeah. And you're you know also, you're, 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 right. yeah, you're also aware, Hey, they might know what I know and they might fuck me up. So you try to deescalate that situation. Well, I mean, I'll know if they train or not, like, <laughs> yeah. bro. Because if we're training, we're probably buddies. I'm yeah. just saying, if you train, well, you know, we're you'll, probably you'll buddies. Get, you'll get that douchebag that trains and is look, it's out there looking for confrontation. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. like those yeah. guys. Yeah, those the yeah. They, I, they I love themselves right out. I love Joe Rogan's response. I don't know who the guest was. It was some guy I wasn't familiar with, but he's like, you know, well, what's the purpose of jiu jitsu? What are you uh, gonna yeah. do with it? And he's exactly. like, well, I'll straight kick your ass. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, he's like, he's like, well, if me and you got in a fight, I would kill you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, because he was like, what's the practicality of jiu jitsu? Like, yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> that was that was perfect. the stupidest. But that guy, he. He's a comedian. Well, he didn't know. And, no, no, he didn't know, and he was just trying to be funny. He's like, "Oh, why would you do this?" I'm like, yeah. "Well, man, you know, we, I, I don't know if you listened to our podcast before, but but I talk about ego, and I talk about how like the biggest lie in jujitsu is the lie of leaving the ego out the door." I was like, "No, no, 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 you can't leave it at the door. You have to have a healthy one, though. You leave that th- if you leave that ego at the door, you're never going to get better in life at anything. Sorry, you're not going to push yourself. Like I'm better than this." That's your ego, right? But if you leave it at the door, you know, you don't have any drive. And if you have an unhealthy ego and you bring it into the, onto the mat, all of a sudden, if you get tapped out, you're pissed. Or you have to feel, you have to prove yourself to other people. Yeah. That's an unhealthy ego. That's not good. That's not going to improve your life. It's not going to help you. There's nothing positive about that. But the great thing about jujitsu is after a certain while, you find exactly where you are at in the pecking order. Yep. You find exactly where you're at, who you have to prove yourself to, who you don't which you'll find out is nobody. You have to prove yourself to nobody. You do it. You train every single day. You know exactly where you live. You know exactly how much, you know, machismo yeah. you may have or may not have. It's fine. My testosterone is low, so it's just awesome. I have nothing to prove. When someone challenges you, you don't have to prove yourself to them because you don't care. You're like, bro, I kill dudes who train. You're not a problem. I'll just, you got this one, dog. Go ahead. Have the hair. I'll buy you a beer and yep. leave, whatever the situation may be. But Not to change the subject, yeah. but I think I'd be more afraid of Joe Rogan's backspin and kick than a choke. Bro. Mm. Did Have you, you seen it? Did you see did you see that video from his round kick alone, bro? He lifted the, the dude GSP, off the ground. The GSB said Joe Rogan had the nastiest kicks he'd yeah. ever seen. Yeah. Like, and he's over fifty. He's fifty. Yeah. He's over fifty. He's well there was uh, who was uh, there was somebody on the podcast that works with him uh the other day. Um Red Band? No, 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 no. That works with him at the UFC. It was uh, one of his MMA fights. One uh, of the, one of his MMA podcasts. And the guy said, he goes, I hate. Oh, they're like Roddy. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I hate holding pads for you. Oh, yeah. He goes, you know, there's certain guys you hate holding pads for, but you know yeah. you do. And he goes, you're one of those ones I hate holding pads for. He goes, because my arms hurt for days after those kicks. Yeah, I can't, for, I can't for me, hold that pads guy, for dudes anymore. For me, it. that guy is my Craig Oxley. Hurt. Can't do it. <laughs> You ever held pads for Craig? Yeah, I'm not holding pads for anybody anymore. Dude, uh, I hold a big shield. Oh, I held I held pads for Craig when he was uh, getting ready for one of his uh, World Combat League uh, matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he broke my forearms. Yeah, I believe it, bro. You know those tie pads. Yeah, I was holding tie pads. Yeah, and he would do the his combo and a kick, and every time he kicked, I would feel it just radiating in my bones. I'm like, man, I can't do this. Dude, yeah. you know who, who builds really, really good combinations? I don't even know the coach's name, but he he teaches out of CSA. CSA. The one that uh, Henry uh, Cejudo just won the UFC belt against DJ. CSA uh, or CSW? CSA. C- is it CSW? Combat submission for Eric Paulson's camp? No, 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 oh, no, no, no. CSA, Let me pull it up real quick here for you. Hold on one second. Uh, the California State Athletic Commission? No? Sure. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, CSA Gym. CSA, CSA Gym. I don't know that one. Yeah, that's the one that Henry Cejudo was out of. You're talking about the guy with the glasses? Yes. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah, he was the one that he was on, guy? He was on yeah. Rogan's podcast. Yes. Right? That yeah. guy, he, that guy's awesome. He builds some crazy combinations. Do you do any striking at all? I saw no, that you have not. some dope ass bags hanging up and a cool little like monkey bar. Yeah, setup I hit them on my own. Like, uh, but no, I'm not. I, st- I took about six months where every day I would, I would uh, train with some guys. Um, 
And that was it. It was after I, I did an MMA fight. I fought Zach Elkins. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't go well for me. What, what, what happened in that fight is um, I had never trained stand up. Not worth mentioning. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't before the fight. I didn't. I didn't get. I didn't have a striking coach. I was going to go in and use Hoist Gracies. I was going to use 100% self defense. So I said, I'm going to go in and I'm going to use the Gracie stomp. That was. I knew this, this is what I'm. Gonna, I had 100% confidence in it. 100%. It was like Gracie stop, clinch, take down. I knew exactly what I was going to do. So the night of the fight, first off, I took the fight and I didn't. I told Smiley. I said, Y'all take whoever. I don't care. I never looked him up. I didn't. I said, I'll fight anyone. I'm confident. Whatever. Yeah. So the night of the fight, I'm there and I'm like, I feel sorry for the fucker that's got to fight that dude. And then they, they call her names. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? This dude's jacked. Like, he's, Zach is a beast, man. What weight was that at? Because 185. He, has... he told me he cut down like 30 pounds. I was going to oh, say. 35 oh pounds. He was just shredded. Well, he's still shredded. Yeah. He's like 42. Yeah, Zach, Zach, is, a, Zach is a monster. Yeah. And, uh, he's a really good friend of mine, too. And, uh, yeah, so I've heard... I've heard his side of the story, but I want to hear your yeah. side of the story because well, so, it's in, it's interesting how they yeah. both kind of mesh out because there was a little bit of a controversy in yeah. there. Yeah, there was. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Hold on. Oh, so so I didn't I didn't know who he was. I didn't know he was gonna look like. I show up the night of the fight and they're like, uh, yeah. So Smiley's talking, talking about the rules. He says no linear kicks. I'm like, it sounds important. What's a linear kick? You know, no no kicks to the knee i'm no like well bleaks. that's a hundred percent of my stand-up that's like you just took <laughs> out you just took out all my stand-up now don't get me wrong like i know like against an untrained fighter i have a i have a strong punch you know and i have a i've kicked the bag a thousand times but i've never kicked it with kicking back right the bags don't kick back right? yeah, so yeah. <laughs> obviously when when I, I stepped in the ring he could evade with no problem all my punches and all my strikes. I did I did manage to get the fight to the ground like four times, which was I just went in just like Superman punch, whatever, and, you know, grabbed. And I got on the fight several times on the ground. And um, the fr- here's the frustrating part. And this is what I what I realized I hated about MMA that time that I'd never that I'd never knew. Number one, I hated the amateur rules. The fact that I couldn't do linear kicks. They took out it. So they. They took out my ability to use self-defense in the fight. They basically turned it into a sport. I didn't like that. But then number two is I earned that fight on the ground four times, and four times they stood it back up. Yeah. And he knew I was a great ground fighter. He he knew that. And mm-hmm. you could hear his corner the entire time going, get back up, Zach, stand up. And you know the other frustrating part? is all four people in his corner were my ex-training partners. All four of them. No. Had, it was Chris Schmidt, who I gave his blue belt to. He, he came up under me. It was uh, – it was, who was the other one? It was Chris Schmidt. It was uh, uh, Sean Doyle, mm-hmm. who I taught at his school for several years at Five Star Mixed Martial Arts, and it was another one. Um, so everyone had been teaching him my game. And when we get to the fight, you could, I've still got the fight recorded and you can hear him saying, get up get, every time, get up, get up. They just wanted the bet, you know, and they knew if he'd just sit there and he'd just sit there and hold me, you know, so, and the ref would go stand back up. I'm like, Father. and we, it went like this and the, there was a time when I got on the legs and you could hear my corner going, heel hook, heel hook. And I'm like, bro, if I could, that, I, that need be mine. It'd just be gone, but you can't. So I did get a straight ankle and I arched with everything I had, man. I, I arched like. I blew out my back on that arch. I just, oh. and he didn't tap, but he did limp out of the ring. So I was kind of like, you <laughs> know, that was my I, win. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, it, it, it was a solid straight ankle, but um, he did beat the shit out of me, man. I like, I'm going to be honest. I, I, I kind of had my little micro wins in there, but somewhere in the third round, um, they, they, we were on the ground again. I was in a good position. I think I was on the legs. I, I thought I was in a good position. I liked it. And they're like, stand up. I'm like, motherfucker, how many times did I get this fight to the ground? Yeah. I stood up too slow. I did stand up and the ref's like, are you all right? I'm like, I'm all right. You know? And he's like, you know, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I, 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 like, I, mean, I know. Like, yeah. yeah. What rank were you? Purple belt at the time. Yeah. This was 2011. I think. It was. Yeah. When did you get your time. black? 2014. 2014. Yeah. Took me. Took me uh, 12, twelve years twelve, from two thousand three to two thousand four. Twelve to two thousand three. Oh, that's okay. I'm at eleven, 11 years. years. I'm a brown belt now, so I feel like yeah, I'm eleven. I'm, yeah. I'm eleven in it. I'm a purple. So you know, yeah. Something I believe on that though. Here's the thing: when when all I wanted was my black belt all throughout my career, I I wanted my black belt so bad, and I would get so frustrated when people would train less than me and get there. So I was like, oh, I trained longer than him. I I would, you know, almost unbecome, you know. Wouldn't be friends with that person. I was like, there was animosity there. And yeah. t- uh, today I have love for all those people. Like th- those are my people. I came up with them. We came up at the same time. Um, 
every instructor has a different criteria. They look at their students different ways. But here, one thing I learned is the longer you put in, the more respect everyone in the community is going to have for you. For example, Mike Bidwell is a perfect example of jiu-jitsu over 40. I think that guy spent like 11 yeah. years as like a brown belt or something. Like this guy put in time for his black yeah. belt. The guy, the guy that does the videos yeah. with, with yeah. all the crazy the moves. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, but, yeah. And here's the thing. Um, that guy's got a mad following. Would it? Would it? Would he be better off today if he were two or three stripes? No, it wouldn't matter. It w- wouldn't matter a bit. The, it took so long for him. That's one of the things people admire, and it's twofold. There, there's an instructor in town, or you know, arguably several, who give out their belts really quick, in my opinion. Um, but it did two things. It did two things. It it hurt his reputation and their reputation. So it's like you give them too fast. And was like, man, that guy shouldn't be a black belt. I've been trained twice as long as him. He shouldn't be a black belt. Now, not only do people hate on him, but they're also pulling down the weight of his instructor. The longer it takes you to get your black belt, not only does it make yours more reputable when you get it, like no, everyone would be like, yeah, art is legit. Nobody yeah. can, nobody can argue it. Right. But on top of that, it makes your instructor more reputable, which makes you more reputable too. It's like a, you know, so Never, you know, be happy. As long, the longer it takes you to get your black belt, honestly, like I say that I'm a black belt now, you know, but if I could go back, I wouldn't care. I really wouldn't yeah. care. It's easy to say, as a, you know, once you're there, but I wouldn't care. Yeah. I think that's where I'm at right now. Like, I, I, I just want to train well, as long as I can. It's one of those things, and I totally know what you're feeling. Like, I came up, or maybe I've been doing it longer, and I see, I'm like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. But I look at my journey, and I've never done anything in my life the easy way. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I've even even when I was in the Navy, I never did that the easy way. I came in at the most junior rank you could, undesignated, blah blah blah. Took the hardest route, took the hardest rate you could pick to make rank. Did all you know? The same thing with my jujitsu career. You know, <laughs> it just is what it is. You know, but at the end, it'll all be worth it. That's how I look at it. So, see, I can, I go up and down with it though. Like, yeah, yeah you know, that's because you're you're still yeah, you're fairly also, new to it. Well, yeah, but no, I mean, like the the whole chasing, you know, chasing that belt, you know, like no, it's not chasing the well, belt. No, there's always well, there again, this is me. I go in waves. Like I'll get to a point where I'm like, man, I really just want to, I want to learn these things on this page to get to blue, and then you know, have a good week in the gym, get some good rolls, and then I just go, man, you know what? I don't care because that's when you don't show up for a month. No, no, no. He goes, <laughs> he goes camping. You know where his camping is? Disney World. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. it's Wild Kingdom. It's not the same thing. No. It's no. not camping, bro. Fort Wilderness. Fort Wilderness. That's not Disney World. You're in a camper, bro. Yeah, I'm in a you're, camper. You're with in a TV. camper with a toilet, <laughs> the stove and shit. Yeah, because I have a wife and kids. I, I, can't. I, don't, I don't know what that means. My dad, my dad was like, uh, climb under the truck. You want shelter? Climb under the truck. We're yeah, going camping. Right. Where, where are we at? Alaska. Yeah, like no. probably about 15 miles into the wilderness. You know that, you that, that show direction. Bush people? Yeah. That was uh, us. That was, I camped that was more us. in Alaska than I have anywhere else I've lived. Yeah. And you come down to lower 48 and they're like, let's go camping. And it's like this nope. nice little, you're in lot 13 already has a fireplace built He's for you. He's such a snob. He don't even like the air down here. He's like, I don't, don't want to breathe this shit. Shit was horrible. <laughs> when I was driving through Canada, I was, I was driving, my family's driving through Canada and I was in the backseat, like looking at the air quality, just get shittier and shittier and shittier. And I was like, oh, this is the lower 48. I was like, take me back. Just drinking that haterade. No, nope. right. nope. all the vitamins, minerals, and one breath. I would love to live in Canada or Alaska. I would, I would absolutely love it. Would it just... was amazing. Yeah, there, I've got awesome. a guy I, I work with. Uh, he, he, work, he used to work here in Florida, and the position opened up in uh, Alaska. He took it. And we're friends on Facebook. And I see what he gets to do and the views on the towers and just what how things are up there. I'm going, man. Damn, you know, I wish, you know, because unfortunately my wife, you know, not unfortunately, but, you know, she's a medical career. She works at Mayo. So there ain't no Mayo in Alaska and she ain't leaving Mayo to go work anywhere else. So it's like, yeah, all right. I Alaska get... is overrated anyway. No, nah, dude, that's where the Russians are coming. Man, yeah, everybody anyway. gets sent down to Seattle. They can anyways. swim. Dude, all the, all the <laughs> shit that he does, like on the weekends, literally kayaking through the rivers the whole like the last three weeks it's been nothing but salmon videos because they're stuck in their freezer and they're just dip netting you know basically you just sit at the river giant net and you just hold it out there and then you salmon swim into it bloop, and then you put your net back in and they're just loading up salmon and i'm just like ah you know he's at one of the cell sites and he takes a you know he sends a picture of the tower and there's just mountains behind it you know and snow and i'm going 
Man, fuck. And he only, gets, he only has to work seven months out of the year. Because the rest of the months, it's all snowed in and he can't go anywhere. So he's like, yeah, cool. This is vacation time now. Does he get paid more than you do? Uh, I don't know. He gets salary. I know that. He's salary because he only he can only work so much there. So, but... Maybe wait till Amanda, you know, retires and then move to Alaska. No, I'd have to... She'd have to die in a horrible accident so I get that life insurance. Oh, okay. Black lottery? Yeah. The dark lottery? Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's waiting for the same thing for me. Ah, uh, so you can wait who out first. Yeah, pretty Speaking much. of, I just saw somebody who's won that $357 million, whatever the hell it was. You know, they're on I was happy driving anyway. over here, I was like... No, they're not happy. I'm sure they're not happy. Let me be that unhappy. on their island. <laughs> on their island, oh I'll probably disappear for like six months if I won the lottery. Six, six months? Yeah. I would text my boss the big "fuck you." And never See, I would. You know, your boss work. is on now, right now. He should be. I would still work. That's what's crazy. Even if I won the lottery, I probably. Still I gotta work. do something. Yeah. Oh, I gotta do work. something. You know. I've already decided. The Mina <laughs> Man's already says took, not me. Full, full time podcaster. It'd be something yeah. I enjoy. Yeah. Like, sure. You know, that's For that's sure. doing something. That's doing full time podcasting, yeah. jujitsu. I'd have an amazing studio for no reason at all. I mean, you I'd can, you can turn this into a career. One person was there. Yeah. Hey, partner. What's up? Welcome. Yeah. Yep. Look at Adam Carolla. You know, he 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 was you know an actor, comedian, whatever you want to call him, but. He's the one that pretty much he's considered the godfather of podcasting. He's well, got yeah. he's got this big warehouse, and all he's got is like little studios with a bunch of podcasts running at the same time. I see that a lot. Factory of podcasts. Well, I are see they, that a lot they now. Hit? They're doing that. Like a lot of people are starting to. Well, it's like a network. Type yeah, you of do thing. a network yeah. thing, and they're getting yeah. like a big building, and you're actually putting in a bunch. Because right. I know yeah. uh, Fighter and the Kid. Uh, Theo, they've got Theo that. Vaughn. Yeah, yeah. Theo Vaughn's doing. They've got their this little cubicles basically where they do their podcast is yeah. he is he renting out the is he making the money off renting out cubicles or are they his advertising so i think if you're under his network he goes out and gets the advertising you get i don't know how much of the advertising that you do for your show but he keeps you know a big chunk of it because he's the one going out there yeah, and it's getting name. it it's his it's his network it's like saying clear channel yeah right. you know it got a bunch of radio stations they got a salesperson that goes and you know, gets the the advertising from Rotor Rooter, and you know, they get a little piece of it. He's so, an interesting dude too. Yeah. he's he's one of those uh, Love Line. Come on, bro. Well, Love Line, but not only that, but he's also like he is a master carpenter. Yeah, you know, I mean, th- things like that interest me. That's why I like uh, the guy who plays Ron Swanson on uh, Parks and is it Parks. Yeah, I don't, Parks I don't watch the show. So. Uh, but you know, uh, he's a master carpenter. You know, he's got a giant shop and stuff like that. So because I like working, I like building stuff. Getting pretty good hey, at it. Would you do me a favor? Your what? your boring art. I'm sorry. I know he's on his phone. Yeah, I got shit. I got dick. Yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super so important. Pro- yeah, so unprofessional, bro. Super important over here. Are, are, are we bothering you? No, no, I don't care. No, no. You want to read this? I know. I don't care. <laughs> Not right now. No, we're doing a podcast. <laughs> I can't wait. Now, uh, Wallo, I have a question for you. Can. Yeah, as a go. as a fellow podcaster, what's hooked up to your phone? Right? Your that phone. camera back there. So oh, you're using this as a monitor for the this. This is the camera communicates the image, and the, this is the the audio going in. Because he's got this little jack there, so we run the audio into the phone. So they're actually listening to better quality audio than what the camera produces. Okay, all right. Yeah, because unfortunately, the audio since it's that far away from where everything is, it would be so but, muffled. Yeah. So why wouldn't this be the audio? Well, well, this, this is. is the audio. So the audio is running from the mics to the mixer, and the mixer is kicking it out to the phone, which is receiving the signal from the camera. Oh, because that's where the Facebook is running. Yes. Right, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So basically, they're getting the image from there, but they're getting the audio through right. the mixer. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. We're speaking of, I got I'm a lot learning. of people asking us about the YouTube. What about What's it? going on? He said we should post on YouTube. Uh, if they go to our YouTube channel, they'll see it. It's yeah. there. It's not channel. live. We don't live yeah. stream it off of. But YouTube it is anymore. there right after. Okay, yeah. cool. So they should they should know that. What? He wants candy. Oh boy, here we go. He Did you eat today? I Wallo. thought you were doing intermittent fasting. Well, I'll get to eat a little bit. How, how within this window? I had, I had eggs and tomatoes today. How long do you intermittent fast for? <laughs> Uh, Get on go, the mic, please. I don't go extreme like this, all these other people. Twenty but, hours, but typically from like nine to about twelve. Yeah, we're completely so against it for him. I do a minimum of nine to nine, but I try to get a I try to get a sixteen hour. Yeah, but I'm a minimum of twelve hour every day minimum. And do you feel a difference day. from the tw- from the twelve to the sixteen? The biggest difference I felt um, is alertness. Holy shit! Like I I started getting twice as much done 
in that in that four hour window in the morning where I would normally be very lethargic, uh, and even coffee. You know, I'm a I'm a I love coffee. Hence jujitsu and coffee. You know, um, I've, I've, I'm always drinking coffee. It's it's black, so no big deal. Um, but yeah, I saw that those four hours became minimum twice as productive. And really? Fast. Yeah. Oh yeah, I saw that. Hmm. For so, sure. you, so you just have coffee in the morning? Yeah, you can get up and have a lot of coffee as long as it's black. It yeah, because oh, okay. there's no caloric intake on the coffee. Right. I do coffee, but I will put cream in it. For for me, it doesn't really matter. I, I used to so much. I Anyways. used to, but you're you're violating the. You're yeah. not fa- technically fasting, and I'm also well. Uh, so several months ago, I went keto, and I, I did go keto like fully keto for about three months, but I was already vegetarian because a year and a half ago I gave up meat. And uh, I tried to go intermittent fasting, vegan keto, and I was just well, that sounds dead like too much. trying to roll. I'm just like, I had nothing. Yeah, I could, like, my body was falling apart. And I was totally. like, all right, well, I, so, um, yeah, I dropped the keto part. But I did it, and I saw what it was about. But you are freaking weak on keto, man. I, I don't know how MMA well, fighters do it. It takes a bit. Well, there's that. Lots, lots of I heard music. there's, like, a one-month lag. Well, right? they, it can be. There can be a one-month. there Because, you know, you get that keto flu. Some people get it. You know, two weeks in and it only lasts a week. Some people get it, you know, a couple months in and it lasts, you know, a month. Well, they explain how to beat that. It has to do with the hydration levels. But, um, yeah, no, as far as the internet fasting, generally I'll eat about 930 at night, like right after my last training session, shower, clean up, all that stuff. And then I won't eat again until about either noon or one. So I've noticed a huge difference as far as like my own weight. Like Wallow rolled me yesterday. He's like, bro, you thin, son. But I said, you're light, you're light, light, whatever. I was, I was like right around the 200 pound mark, but I felt kind of like, you know, heavy in the stomach, you mm-hmm. know, and now I'm like 181, you know, and I feel, I feel better. I move better. Yeah. My joints don't hurt as much, you know? So. so I just have a hard time trying to fit all my calories in such a smaller window. I've been a fat ass since my surgery, so. I don't, <laughs> even, I don't even follow my cal- caloric intake. You even. know, one thing that helps me get, get through that. It though, because like I, I'm one of those, I do get a little hangry. A, a little, a little, a little. I've gotten better, but <laughs> okay. As far as the fasting portion, though, like somebody says something about like you know uh, a fat lion or whatever isn't hung- you know what I mean doesn't get shit done. You know what I mean? You have to be a hungry lion to get shit done. You know what I mean? So I think about that. I'm like, well, I'm a little hungry right now. I was like, well, I got to get shit done before I I, I earn to eat. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I'm, th- I'm thinking in the morning. I was like, well, I need to get through this amount of patience before I earn to eat, or I need to get through this practice and come home and take care of these certain amount of things before I earn to eat. So I think I got. I don't know if that's the right way of thinking about it, but like, if I'm not doing what I need to do to earn to eat, like I'm not going to eat. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Like, so it kind of forces me to be more productive. I think maybe that's same thing with you, but maybe just a different way of thinking about it. Well, they it. say like. You know, when you're fasting, your your body goes into that that state where you're you're a hunter. You know, your your alertness goes up and your your awareness goes up. Like, man, I'm hungry. My body's going. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm. But I think I, that alertness for me, that awareness for me, translates to productivity. Yeah, I'm just. I, I have an IT job eight to five. I've been in IT twenty four years, and uh, I I became twice as productive. Like I got, really? man, I, yeah, I was arguably failing at my job before, before I started fasting. And after I started fasting, man, I'm, I'm one of the better guys on the team again. Really? No, they wait. noticed the difference. They're like, yo, Bobby, I know my boss you? noticed the difference. Every, like clearly it, 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 it made my job a lot easier and I'm not, I'm not making crap up. I'm not exaggerating. Like, honestly, um, I don't enjoy my job. No one, anyone who says they enjoy it is smoking crack. There's something wrong with them. It's, it's a, it's a monotonous, droning <laughs> sucks the life out of your job. You're just sitting there doing, you know, monotonous fixing shit, you know, that's like, ah, just anyway, I, nobody, but it, likes well. but it pays well. You guys, so we you have a it, call you know. and it's oh. Brandon. What's up, Brandon? What can we do? You what for? up? What up? Do you have any questions for Bobby? Yeah, I actually did. Cause I was, I'm actually doing the intermittent fashion right now to get myself ready for the, 2018 Masters Worlds, and I was going to ask Bobby if he found that it was easier if he's, if he's done the 20 and 4 fasting, or if he does the 18 6. No, I didn't. Uh, I'm not. I'm not super uh, educated on it. What, one of my students who lost a lot of weight, mind you, he lost like 40, 50 pounds in, in a really short amount of time doing the intermittent fasting. Um, that's not what turned me on to it. I don't want to lose weight. He, what turned me on to it is he was talking about this alertness he was that he had and this productivity. He's like, dude, my productivity went up at work. And I was like, really? Because I need more productivity. I was like, so 
I, uh, man, I wish I could tell you, you know, about that because I, I really started doing it just for the productivity purpose, for the, the alertness and awareness, which I, I definitely see. But um, I'm just doing, I'm doing 16 hours and I, I really, my goal is 16, but once in a while I end up cheating, but I'll never go below 12. 12 is my absolute minimum. But I see my stomach's kind of coming down a little bit, right? Like, because I'd be up late at night and I'm eating. Like you're at the computer and you're just like, if you're not fasting and you're at your computer at one in the morning, you're like, where's some chips at? Oh, yeah, you're, snacking. You're, just, you're snacking, right? And that's your, that's where the bad calories come from. But um, Right. Yeah, man, I wish I had more well, for you, Brandon. It's good to hear from you, by the way. You too. Happy birthday, brother. Thank you. Yeah, I've been doing the 20 and 4 fasting. Um, that's insane. I've noticed that it seems like, God, yeah, it's, it's pretty tough. But uh, I think you're right about the alertness. It seems like when I'm in the situation – of needing the alertness that it's there because I'm able to function through the hunger a little bit and function more like a hunter, I guess you'd say. But when I'm not doing something that really needs my attention, I just seem to be a little more scatterbrained on it sometimes because huh. I'm thinking about, okay, well, what time is it? Is it five o'clock yet? Can I eat yet? Can I, I mean, what am I doing here? Yeah. Uh, but it seems like when I'm on the mats or, um, I mean, Art's been around me uh, since I started this diet. Um, we've gone out to lunch, and, you know, he's ordering food and stuff like that, which is, you know, no problem, but I get water. Yeah. And because I'm not within my period of being able to actually eat. But it seems that when I eat, the, one, my portions are substantially shrunk. And two, during that time frame that I'm supposed to be eating, nothing else exists. It's literally eat. That's it. I don't think right. about jujitsu. I don't think about bills. I don't think about the fact that I leave the car running. Is the stove on? None of that. It just seems like all I care about is eating at that point in time. Brandon, it's because you're but starving. But when I'm not... 20 and 4 is crazy. <laughs> that Do is, you tailor yeah. your hours around your training? Yes. Do you eat like before yeah, and my, after? My hours all... usually... Usually the way I'm doing it right now is I have a... By 24... Um, Obviously, I don't eat while I'm sleeping. I don't eat breakfast. I don't eat lunch. Um, I fast throughout the day till 4.30, which gives me a fasting time between 4.30 and 8.30 that I can eat. Well, I start jujitsu class at 7 o'clock every single night. So really between 4.30 and 6.45 is my eat time. But I, I gorge. I mean, I, I don't necessarily gorge, but I, I go... And I do 100%. And I'm still eating clean, but I'm not watching the portions as much as I guess you could say. Well, you, you, you got to still get a certain amount of calories in because you're putting yourself at a big deficit. So if you don't know exactly how many calories you need to take in to put yourself at a specific de- deficit that you want for your yeah, specific well, I do, weight I loss, do count the co- I do, then be real yeah, careful I make about sure that. that, that my, yeah, I, I do make sure that I do have at least a small amount of carbs. Uh, just to allow me to have the energy pretty much for jujitsu class. Um, but at the same time, the calorie intakes that I'm bringing in, I've calculated that I've burnt that off through the 20 hours of no eating oh, already. Easy. Easy. So what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm actually, if I'm taking in 1600 or 1600 carbs. Then I've already burnt 2000 because I haven't been eating. I've been, I mean, I work, constru- I own a construction company. I train twice a day, sometimes three. So I've already burnt those calories down. Yeah, yeah. So I've brought well, myself down to a. We get, we get that, basis man. Of when it comes, to, we get that. But when it comes to your your percentage of deficit, you're not supposed to go over a certain amount of percentage of deficit because once you do, it actually starts taking all the vital nutrients and stuff from your bones, your muscles, your tendons get weaker, your ligaments get weaker. You have to be very mindful of exactly what kind of de- percentage of deficit you're putting yourself into. Now, I understand the eating uh, changes, and I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a nutritionist, uh, so you might want to consult with those guys, but you got to be very careful because if not, you're going to have a catastrophic injury, you're, you're, especially with, the, right, with, right. The, with that, the sport we that's, do. That's one thing I do worry about. I think I've talked to you about that before. Um, but another question I had for Bobby was um, I wanted to ask him. Uh, he was talking about the – kids gi and no gi classes Mm -hmm. and i have found because i I do the kids program at the school that i work at i've found that it seems like i can get the kids more involved with their in a gi because of this just the simple it gives them something to feel proud of would you agree with that 
I do. Um, my no gi class, I cannot get the same participation in. It doesn't matter if I swap yeah, days. I'm having the exact same problem. The kids don't feel like martial artists in it. They don't feel like, you know, they, they want to, a lot of it is they want to show off their belt. Like some kids show up because they're like, look, I'm the higher, you know, the, the higher ones show up to be the boss. You know, like, look, I'm, I'm the gray belt. You know, you're, you're below me. But, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, maybe that is it. Maybe that's not. But unquestionably, I get more participation out of my gi class. That's, that's a, that's a fact. And that's something I've I was wondering if you had the same, because I've noticed that also. I mean, it seems yep. like just getting them started for the class, they're like wandering around, just kind of blase, blase. But when it's gi time or when it's a gi class, they come in, they get their gi on immediately. There's no like, hey, come on, let's go, let's roll, let's go. They're sitting there ready to go because they're so proud to be wearing that yep. uniform. And yeah. all they care about is that strike that they can possibly yep. get. Yep. Do you think it has anything to do with, you know, kids are like, oh, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a, you know, a cop. And it's something to do with that uniform and it's official and it's yeah. something like, you know, to be proud of. Yeah. And I guess with the gi in a kid's mindset, it's the same thing. They put on a uniform. It's, you see something like it's something. Well, they're part of something. And, yeah. They're part of a team. I yeah. Think it's a they're role playing. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're, but I, I get, I get about double the part participation on in my yeah. kids classes yeah gi. i also look at it like when i talk to people about training in the gi versus no gi is and people will ask me like newcomers especially girls you know that i talk to they're like well what do you like better what's easier to learn i said well it kind of depends on on your own thing but for me the way i look at the gi is like learning to drive a car with a stick versus you know an automatic for me the gi was easier to transition to no gi than if i had learned no gi and tried to do the gi Strong possibility. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, last question I got for Bobby. All right. What do you do with your middle of the ground teenage, not quite adult, but too big to be in the kids' class, too young or too small or too immature to be in the adult class? What do you do with those kids? I lump all my kids together from five to up to 13. At 14, I want them in the adults class, first off. But if they pay attention uh, and they're sharp kids, I'll let a 12-year-old in the in the adult class if they don't disrupt it. So if, they, if they're if they legit and they want to learn jiu-jitsu and they can pay attention, I'll let a 12-year-old. And I've had some 12-year-olds just, you know, blossom in, in my adults class. So for me, if that kid's responsible and he can pay attention, I'll take them at, I'll take them at, at the earliest at 12 in the adult class. But I don't separate. That's what I was wondering is. I don't mind. Yeah, the the thing I was trying to do is wonder. I was wondering. I was like, how do you deal with that thirteen year old that has the mentality of a eight year old? Yeah. But you got an eight year old who has the mentality of a thirteen year old. Yeah. The way I te- although I teach one class, we kind of separate. We'll have separate topics going on in the class. You know, I'll kind of have one instructor go one way with with this group of kids, and one go one way with the other group of kids. Yeah. That's good. Well, that that's what I I've, I've had a, an issue with that recently. I've got. One fourteen-year-old whose brother is nine, and the nine-year-old is much more mature, much more adapt to learn than the fourteen-year-old brother who doesn't really care about anything other than just going out there and sitting because he feels like his parents are forcing him to be there, kind of thing. Yeah, I will say this here. I will. I will real quickly say this as as uh, someone who's either you know a school owner or invested in your school, trying to build your school. Um, if you ask me, the money is in the kids. If you're trying to make money, there is no money in adults. I don't, there, there is no money in adults. If, if an, an adult, we're not getting in fights at 35 years old. You know, it's, it's a secondary thing. It's something you want to be, but when times get hard, the adults, it's one of the first thing that gets cut. Parents invest in their children. They do. The children, you know, parents will put their children's first. They all do. All parents put their children first and what their kid wants to do, they're going to do. So my kids are really my primary source of income, you know, for my school, even though, um, you know, I have a, I have a decent group of adults, but I have friends that started their school, like uh, Chris Kofstadt, you know, he owns uh, Camden Combatives and he's murdering it with his kids, just absolutely slaughtering it. I mean, his, he, he's making a, you know, I don't want to get in his business, you know, but I don't think he'd mind. We're, we're really close friends. The guy's got a phenomenal kids program. He doesn't need adults. He's got it all going on with his kids. And what, you know, it's interesting because I remember like, you know, Luis didn't focus so much on kids and we had this conversation and now he has a really good, I'm not saying it's because of me, 
but you know, I, I'd like to think I played an influence. Like he's got a really good kids going class going on. Sometimes you'll see 25, 30 kids show up for a kids class. Sometimes I get 25. I've had 26 kids this year at the most in one class, just in, you know, that's, I, I never get that in adult class. I, you know, technically I have, but that was really rare. That was like a one-off. So yeah, that's a little bit of yeah, my stuff, you know. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Cause I, I've been trying to work through that, trying to get, you know, these programs set up properly and everything like that. And I do appreciate it. I've always looked up to you as a mentor and you've, uh, you've always been there to give me good advice. So I appreciate it. And, Super stoked to have you on that podcast so I can be able to listen to you. Yeah, I was texting you, earlier because I did family time. And when I'm doing family time, I can text, but I can't talk. <laughs> yeah. Man, it's good to hear from you. I hope you, uh, I'll be Thank watching. You too, hope brother. you do well in the world. I hope so too. I got 39 people in my bracket. Damn. So That's a big bracket. It's a, yeah. I'm one of the larger Man, brackets. Some of those brackets year. get like 90s, 100s. Yo. Yeah, yeah but 30s. what he failed to mention is that 27 of them are women. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> what were you trying to say about the women? Yeah, I think one we'll uh, about Be careful, careful. I'm sorry, women, yeah, so, women, and they're 115 pounds. Yeah. So Walla is the only uh, female over 150 in my bracket. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you for the call, man. You guys right. have a good one, and uh, I'll continue to listen. You all have a good one. All right, All right bro. Peace. Peace. Actually, he won't be able to because for some reason the camera's acting up and it's not connecting. So we have to shut down the stream. But oh. he, he'll he'll get the rest of the audio. Yeah. yeah but yeah, but yeah no. As far as uh, yeah, as far as uh, yeah, kids classes and stuff like that, I think that's you know for most martial arts programs, it's kind of like that is the finance. You know, Dude, look at Karate America. Going. Karate America. Yeah, crushes it's, on kids. it's crushing it's kids. it. It's all kids. You're gonna crush it with the kids. Like I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know what you got going on with the kids program, but if if you start building that side, that's where the revenue is. It's well, not, yeah. Adults fall; they all fall off. Yeah. You, a few, the, up to, the the only adults that, that stay with it are the savages, right? Yeah. That's not the case with kids. With kids, you'll get kids that they'll just want to progress to them belts. Um, and I do it. What I did is I adopted the IBJJF belt system for that's kids. They they too. have three, but I went with the one that works out to twelve classes per stripe, and that increased their attendance because they know when they're going to get their strike. There's no, it's like, I even, I even made a program where they just check in every day and they're like, Oh man, every day the kids come in, they're like, how many more classes to my next strike? I'm like, Oh, you're at eight. You know, every, it's right there in front of me. So yeah. that, that keeps them motivated. It's a huge motivator. That's for interesting. Kids. That think, is true. My huge. kids were pretty motivated when they knew how many classes they need to do. And I think with the school that they went to, it was like 20 classes per strike. Yeah, I think the but one, I've uh, got my program is set up for like 31 classes or something like that. See, the, the more you promote them, yeah. they have three different belt systems. Yeah. I went with the one that has 12 stripes per belt. Oh, where you change oh, the okay. white to the black stripes. The, yes, I know yeah. what you're talking and about. And that yeah. way, that way I'm promoting them every 12 days. So yeah. th they have systems where you only go four stripes per belt. Well, but then they got to go 30 days. And what will happen is you'll have a kid fall off and he won't make it those 30 days. Yeah. yeah. It is proven that the more often you promote him, like if you get a kid that's getting ready to fall off, it he's got three days left. He's you know he's lost his motivation, and, and then he comes into class. It's like, bro, three more days to your next promotion. He's like, crap, I'm going to get that promotion. It's a big deal. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And then he's then you got him through the month, you know, or you got him through the week, whatever. Yeah, because kids, you you got to always dangle that carrot. Yeah, I, I think you need to put Chris on that program because. You know, you know how he does sometimes. I might need to put Chris in that program. <laughs> Chris, we're going to go to a 12 strike program for you, buddy. 12 strike program. We're going to get you that blue, baby. We might even give you a green belt. Hey. Ooh. I, I yeah. did something similar for my adults. Yeah. Um, so I did, I took that same system and what I did was put a minimum amount of classes for every stripe for each adult and a minimum amount of time. So now they have a system which I can pull up online anywhere. And they can it too from home. And they can look and see that they know you're not going to get your next stripe. You're not going to get your next belt until you have this amount of time and this amount of classes. Because if you don't monitor that, you're going to end up promoting guys who've been training with you for eight years, twice a month. It's not fair. And then you, you look, when you really look at the numbers, you got a guy coming in five days a week for three months. It's like, wait a minute, he outperformed this guy, at least as far as attendance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we take it. Those are minimums. I'm not saying, oh, that day, oh, you put those classes in, you get promoted. Yeah. I'm saying if if you're at that level, if I feel, you know, this is now the system's telling me, hey, this guy's eligible, right? So, 
It well, motivated my adults. Well, when it comes to like uh, even our belting program for for our adults, I mean, I have the minimum amount of days. Like for a, for well, it depends if you're an, if you're gonna be an instructor for that belt or if you're gonna be you know that belt. But like even like my blue belts are 110 to 120 days. You know what I mean? I think it comes out to like 10 months to 14 months on average for a blue belt. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty that's pretty legit. I mean, I think I was overstretched at two and a half years. Is that for to a get blue promoted? Belt. 10 to 14 months. To the next to belt. the next belt or mm-hmm. the next stripe? No, 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 no. For blue belt, I'm talking about specifically for blue belt. Some, some, some coaches don't do stripes. Some don't. Yeah. It's just like, hey, welcome. This is your- hey, I've, 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 I've been a purple for three years. I got no yeah, stripes. And and so, and so, I got no stripes. And then some do do <laughs> stripes. And, and you're right. It's a it's a motivational thing. So, hey, man, I'm a three stripe blue. Oh, okay, cool. Well, you're almost to your purple then, aren't you? That's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty cool, you know. Uh, and then the savages that like will go for a certain amount of time and not care about it. They just want, am I getting better? Yeah, I'm getting better. How am I feeling? I'm cool. You know, but we're the low percentage, right? It's a very low percentage of that. that my, my, my gauging of how I'm doing is talking to you and talking to Dean. I take those two and I'm like, all right, I guess I'm, I'm where I should be. Cool. Here's what I need to work on. Yeah. You know, and that's it. That's it for me. I don't care about stripes. I don't care about the belt. It'll come when it comes. There's a lot of people that do, though. It's kind of not – what it is, I think, is recognition. There's people that won't train <sighs> with you. There, I mean, in fairness, that is that is the sad part, right, is that there's people out there that don't want to train under someone that's not a black belt. I mean, that's yeah. not fair. I, I, like, you know, part of me says, well, that, oh, that he'll be back or whatever, you know, but uh, we all struggle with it. Um, but there are people. I had a guy come into my – This is here's a really interesting one. I had a guy come in my class, come into my school once. He shows up for class. He goes – do you have 10,000 hours in? And I was like, what? Uh, he goes, do you have 10,000 hours of jujitsu? And I'm like, sure. I don't know. He goes, cause you're not an expert unless you have 10,000 hours in it. You, you know, to be an expert at something, this guy starts waxing intellectual with me. He's like, he's you're talking not about Keith, uh, Keith, what's his Owen? I think put in about, said something about 10,000 hours. Like, this goes outside yeah. of you. I started researching it. Yeah, and this, this is, is like, there's psychologists, or, you know, there's science. There's this, there's a scientific rule that says you're not an expert until you have 10,000 hours into something. But what's funny is I told the guy, I was like, man, I'm, I'm not really sure I've got 10,000 hours in. I don't know. At the time, I was a brown belt, right? He never came back. It's like he wanted someone that had 10,000 hours of instruction. You know, That's kind of a dickish move <laughs> Tell to that approach to the... somebody. You're like, uh, I'm, you're going to teach me, but you need to have this amount of hours? Uh, you're a white belt, and my rank is a little bit higher than yours, so yeah. I might have something to show you. Tell that to the expert nog belt I have. Yeah. Yeah. If I, yeah, you know, there's a there's a point in time where I did uh, count out my hours, and I think it was somewhere in purple belt. But basically, it was, uh, and I was training twice a day, so it was like between three and six hours a day, five to seven days a week for six years, and and it's nonstop. Like maybe I had a month yeah. off here or there um, for maybe injury or something like that. But when I counted up those hours, yeah, it's a ridiculous amount of time. But even now. Uh, just, just instructing alone, six, seven days a week. You know what I mean? Multiple classes, two, two hour classes. I'm like, bro, pretty sure we put some pretty, pretty sick hours in there. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm just amazed my body's held up as much as it has. <laughs> this is great. I don't know. You're banged up. You, you, you're, you're wearing a bandage. I don't know how much, you know, holding still up. I don't understand got. why it's glowing. Bionicle, man. Bionicle. Can I have some? <laughs> it, it's, it's the herbs. No, I don't want that. <laughs> I just need something he's, for. He, he's got an outbreak of herbs. That's why they're glowing. On my elbow. I don't, I don't know if that works. <laughs> we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> don't train self worth. Anyways. Uh... <laughs> oh. Man, when I was. Um, I visited a school in, in, in South Florida. In this school, I'm not, I'm not going to drop their name because maybe they don't want me to drop their business, you know, like, but man, the school was pulling in $250,000 a month, a month I believe teaching it. jujitsu. I believe it. Isn't that crazy? There's schools out there that do that. Quarter mil a month. Like, I yeah. can't even fathom that. I can't Sounds remember. like ATT. Ooh, I put their business out there. <laughs> Quarter mil a month. Yeah. I believe it. Dan Lambert. I believe it. There's, there's guys out there that are doing, I, I know, ATT? I know specific no. guys from certain systems. And I've talked to him personally, and uh, yeah, crazy amount. Like twenty, well, like these guys, very successful. Over twenty thousand dollars a month after overhead, after paying instructors, after 
3000 a month. And I'm like, whoa, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> you know there's always I mean? a chance. Right. Yeah, but you I just want to get to have I, my kids. first goal is just uh, the, the 100 person mark. I, we go to the 100 person mark and we just teach good jiu jitsu and just create a nice strong family and so and so forth. Yeah. And you know what's funny? It's like I tell my guys to go train at other places. And I was like, I know pretty much everybody in town. I can tell you exactly what you get from every person in town. Go there because they're going to give you this. Go there. You're going to get that. Go there. You're going to get that. It's funny because, you know, we, we tell that to our guys. But a lot of people don't want that to happen. Sometimes eh, it all depends on how comfortable they feel. Yeah, it is what it is. They think they're, they're, I, I, know, I know one instructor in town who, if he finds out you cross-trained, you're out of his school. You're, you're yep. crown. You're done, man. Yeah. You're done. You you are a traitor. You're unfriended, and you're just man. Let's let's be honest. There's there's a few of those. There's a, yeah. There's a few. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, well, listen, some, are, some are worse than others. Some are like more strict. Than I, others. I started with Dean, you know, and he always told me, "Oh, you Dean's know, sweetheart, bro. He yeah, uh, he was like, you, yeah, come you train everywhere. wherever you want. Just know this is your home, you know. And for sure, I mean, it's only now that because you know at the time I I left I I stopped training with him because. He stopped teaching at one point, and you know. Then I went and started training with Art, and you know now we have AOWJJ. So, but now that he's back full time, I, I intend to at least visit him once a week because his his teachings, you know, they're very important to me. You know, and having both Art and him, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that for me for my personal, you know, uh, journey. You know, so. I yeah, Dean's a beast. And everyone knows that. Yeah, I, I, my roles with him are super fun. There are certain guys that are fun to roll with. And I, I've said this probably a thousand times before, but I mean it. There's some guys where I was just like, I don't like rolling with that guy. It's a horrible experience. It doesn't feel like the exchange is there. And then there's certain guys like Dean, when you roll with them, you it's fun. Like, even if you get your ass, let's say you get your ass beat. Oh, right? he beats my ass you're, constantly. You're like, do this, do that again. That's That was a fun roll. That yeah. was some cool stuff going on there. You know what I mean? Like, we got to get him on. There like he's that. so elusive. Well, it's because he's... Man, a, we got, we, he, he dropped into the school before the Craig Jones seminar. You know, he come, came in and paid me. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we talked for like an hour, hour and a half. And uh, we, we had a long talk. We were both into crypto, turned out. You know, like he's into... Oh, yeah. He's, he's also yeah, vegan. Yeah. He's deep. Yeah. And we have diets in common. We were yep. just talking for a while. I, I only rolled with Dean once when I dropped into Victor's school a long time ago. I was a purple belt. This was like 08, 09, maybe 09, 2009. He was, I think he was still training at Victor's. And uh, and we rolled, and he was a straight beast, man. It was it was uh, that was a, a, a tough roll, man. Uh, yeah, he got me, you know. Obviously, he's, <laughs> he's like, Dean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we but um, but yeah, we talked, and we, we really we really jived, man. We were we were talking crypto, we were talking diet, man, and we we're talking about his uh, like his what he's his uh, his what's the right word for it? Like he's kind of like his farm he's got going on in his house. Yep. You know, he's kind of growing his own food and whatnot. He's got he's chickens. Cool Self sustainability. Yeah. yeah, he's a cool dude, man. Dean now, is. Now, why does he have chickens? For the eggs, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But he's vegan. I don't know. Maybe his wife and his kid want to eat them. Okay, that could be it. Because I know that. Well, no, that's the big thing. If you're, you know, because Dad did that. Dad was vegan, like hardcore vegan for a bit, and it just didn't work out because he's like, man, I miss my eggs. I want to eat my eggs. Yo. Know? Oh, I miss the steak, right? No, well, he eventually, it, that's the thing. It went from eggs to then to fish. So then he was just eggs and fish for a little bit. And then he's just like, ah. I yeah. don't know what they call it, but someone, she considered herself vegan or something. But she was like, but I'll eat stuff if I if it's easily or readily, like, right there. I can catch it, kill it. So she would eat eggs. That's called a fake fit. vegan. And I didn't. I was like, but that's meat. So I don't get how you're a vegan. She goes, well... Blah blah blah, and I was like, I don't, I don't get it. See, dad, dad know, was yeah. a flex. He considered himself a flexitarian. Maybe it was something like that. Yeah, she was like, he was, he was nutrient fluid. Yeah, exactly. I was like, well, you can go on that, you know, that field right there, kill that cow and get it right. She goes, no, I'm not going to do that. It's like, but you're yeah, eating no, the work. eggs and killing, you know, killing fish. Well, okay. eggs are free. That's like rent free. Yeah, I don't pay for eggs either. Yeah, so. You got, got chickens a, at all? No, my kids have chickens at their dad, so I have ah, never-ending supply okay. eggs. Nice. Yeah, we try to stay away from, like, buying the eggs at the store. I get my eggs from my buddy up the road here. He's got chickens? Yeah, he's got, uh, he just re-upped. He's got 70, 70 laying hens. So We oh, get duck wow. eggs, chicken eggs, whatever. Those duck eggs taste like 
Like a chicken. Like, like Doug. They're just bigger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they. I like to horrible. bake with them because like it the gets a little taste. bit more eggy in there and it's not so small. Mm. They're good, though. Yeah, the biggest thing is we've, uh, like the farm eggs we get, they're like, I mean, they're orange. When you crack them open, yep. they ain't yellow. They no, are they're orange. bright orange. Like orange. 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 Say dog. Hmm? Say dog. Dag. What? <laughs> Say dog again. Dag. Dag. Like dags? Dag? You like yeah. dags? You like dags? Yeah, I like dags. I like dog. caravans better. <laughs> no, the hardest ones for me is, uh, that's why I, I've said it before. I, I, I always say rescue unit because I have a real hard time saying ambulance. Ambulance. I'll say ambulance. And well, that's because you're from Callahan. Callahan. And I have to, I have to think about it when I'm when I'm talking with the kids or anything, and we're using crayons to color with because, crowns. because I just go crowns. We're using crowns. That's because you you're you so ate too many back. crayons yeah. as a kid. No, I was just that's <laughs> born in the woods, man. And the well, paint chips. Mm-hmm. Jesus, bless his heart. Bless, <laughs> bless my heart, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, sweetheart. <laughs> Jeez, man. Uh, but now I'm super stoked about Dean opening up his uh, his MMA. Uh, yeah, his, his, his teaching. He's yeah, programming. Yeah, you know, I mean, the school's shoot. always been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to shoot over there and say what's up. Of course. Uh, he gave me a really great compliment. Uh, actually, the first time I came over there and I rolled with you, and he was like, hey, man, you kind of look like a little mini Marcelo Garcia, because I play a lot of the butterfly guard and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, was, I just remember that day. I was like, man, that's the best compliment. I've never received a compliment better than that. When because one, I love Marcelo Garcia to death, and I model a lot of my game after him. And so, like he said, that was kind of like, oh, you're automatically good in my book, dude. But <laughs> so, like, yeah. I think one of my first impressions of Dean. Yeah, yeah, we've him. we've heard the story like a million times, bro. Well, I don't. Know. I was kidding. I know. <laughs> now, Wallo though, he was a dick. I was glad to stop him in front of Dean. That was great. He's like, I'm glad I crushed you then. Yeah, I crushed you. <laughs> I think you were a blue belt at the time, right? I don't know. You might have been a blue belt. Something like that, but yeah, that was a fun role. I'm you know? still a blue belt. And, and Wallow's like, yeah, Wallow's uh, one of those very unassuming guys, man. It's, it's tough to roll with. I'm just like a ball. It's like a ball. Try to pull an arm away yeah, from the ball. There's no, a, there's no, yeah. it's a dangerous ball. Are you ball. okay? Yeah, I just got scared for that yeah. thunder. We got storms over us. We right had now. lightning so bad at the house last night. I heard my. My daughter's boyfriend was at the house yesterday. Oh, oh shit. Boy. And so I have the new ring doorbell that new does ring? the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, She's going she to need that new keep, ring. Keep I get a chime on my phone anytime someone comes at the door. So I, you know, I saw them go out and then all of a sudden I see like lightning flashing and then boom. So I could tell lightning was flashing like right there. I was like, where the hell are my kids? And I see them come running. Jake comes in first and I was like, where's Caitlin? I'm calling her. They came in so soaking wet, and there was, like, three lightning strikes in our subdivision. And, uh, yeah, it sounded close like that. Like wow. It was yeah, that brutal. One, that one was far away. Well, we had one uh, Friday night. Yeah, Friday night we had a little afternoon storm, and one popped in. The, there's a tree back here that's going to drop probably this storm season or winter because it got popped. Something got popped back there because I was sitting in the in the living room, and whole living room lights up. And then immediately before the light even fades, you hear it. It's like, oh, all right. that was right there. So Speaking of Pop, died. how's your Pop doing? He's good. He's good. I talked to him the other day. asked him how he's feeling. He's like, great. Feel great. I'm a little tired tonight. I was like, yeah, well, you kind of had a busy week. You know? So, mini stroke just, shit. yeah, <laughs> to uh, bring everybody up to speed, Chris's dad had a mini stroke. Little little mini stroke. Apparently, uh, was... he's been chewing on the Viagra like he's candy. No, that's, that's what happens, guys. Right? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> they ain't they ain't Tic Tacs. But John Jones says just a little twist at the end of the punch. punch right? yeah. Yeah. He was trying to put a knockout at <laughs> yeah. the end of the punch. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, got it. Yeah, he's good now. I told him it's like he he's got to stop. He's got to stop visualizing using the treadmill <laughs> and, <use> and actually <laughs> move to the next step of using the application. Treadmill. Yeah, application. Now, what's funny is visualization, is he, visualization, and application. Yeah. It's so, huge. what's and funny is is uh, in the new house there, there there's a whole room that's going to be a workout room. It's large, and he's going to put a bag up. So he ain't going to do shit. Well, he's, he's at home. He's, he's alone. He's going to be bored. He should do a class somewhere. Jump on one of his 10 screens. Yeah. Well, th- that's the thing. I, th- I need to look that up because I've been telling him about the strike fit stuff. Because dad is, dad is not doing jujitsu. That's just not his speed. Listen, just go to Orange Street or something. 
or yeah. what is it? Orange Theory. I'm sorry, Orange uh, Theory yeah. is the hot dog. About to say what you trying to. <laughs> <laughs> That's Nick likes theory. Orange Theory. Orange Theory. Yeah, Nick does. Nick he loves uses it a lot. So, but I got to find something for him to do. Yeah. You know? But now, granted, with the new house, he's going to have uh, the whole back forty is going to be gardening and stuff like that. So he's going to no, have. Stuff. He, needs, he needs to like. Get out and do stuff. Well, that's just it. I mean, if he's gardening, he's going to be out doing stuff. Right now, he just doesn't. He's going to have, have a heat stroke. Is what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah you get, no, because he's he does the same job I do. So we're in the heat. So that's fine. All right, you're finding excuses for your daddy now. Sure, thank you. It's good. Yeah, we'll let him. We'll let him next time they're in Jacks. We'll be like, all right, come on and defend yourself. Defend your honor. All right, guys. Before we end the podcast, Bobby, why don't you give a plug to your school and where they can find your. Uh, your podcast. So uh, my school's Checkmate Jiu-Jitsu and Self-Defense. It's in uh, it's on St. John's Bluff. And uh, podcast is, on, we're on Podbean, and it's Jiu-Jitsu and Coffee. And uh, working on getting on iTunes, they have a problem. Um, like, I created multiple accounts. They can't, it's like, apparently it's not working for anyone. New signups right now. They're trying to work through it. Oh. But we're also on YouTube. So right now we're just on YouTube and, YouTube and Podbean. And I'm working on Spotify. I think Spotify requires 10 episodes first. Um, and there's one or two others, Ron, I can't remember, but, uh, yeah, we're working on it. So you got a website? Not, no, I do, but it's not, I'm working on the website. Okay. So I bought fullywoke.com. Nice. Fully woke. Woke. <laughs> well, we'll get the issue back on and we'll talk about it. Yeah. God, yeah. How was that not taken? Yeah. We'll have, we'll have, <laughs> I, know, right? I, mean, I, really I don't seriously. know how it's not taken, it but we'll, taken. we'll have to have you on just to go over that a yeah. lot. That part of, yeah. Yeah. Sure. We'll, we'll, sk- you know what? That might be a good thing for. For Robbie? No, for the for the big one that me and you've been talking about planning. Well, for the hundred? Yeah, do just the whole conspiracy get all, yes, theory. Get all the conspiracy guys in. Yeah. Start putting aluminum foil on the windows. <laughs> the woke one hundred. Yeah. The woke one hundred. We can do yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All yeah. right. Well, we'll try to set that up then. I'll talk to Robbie yeah. and uh, that and uh, Jarrell. I think Jarrell. That could be fun. Theory. Yeah. We'll see if the computer gets hacked and it's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, before we go, give a shout out to the sponsors. Uh, Lean Impact Nutrition, doesn't matter if you're a performance athlete or an average show, you want a six pack or you want to get that much further in competition, uh, leanimpactnutrition.com. Uh, they'll get you right. My boy Zach Elkins, take care of you. Uh, if you want the dopest tattoos in Jacksonville, blackhivetattoo.com. They have many artists out there, but you need to sign up to their newsletter so that way you know how to get onto them. Uh, if not, you're going to be hanging out in the wings. Months and months, oh, and months and months and months at a time. You gotta pop you gotta pop off, sign up for the newsletter, blackhivetattoo.com. Sherry, any plugs? Any 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 shout outs you wanna give out? No, I'm good today. Oh New ring. no Bert. New ring. <laughs> I just spent all weekend New with Bert. Bert. Yeah. I think he'll be okay. Yeah, you don't wanna give him a shout out? No, Hi, Bert. okay. Fine. Uh, Chris, hey, anything else you wanna add? No, just as always the wife. She's the best. All Making right. all the meals. Today. I love you, Amanda. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for your support. Sorry that we lost the stream. Something happened where we lost connection and it never came back up. So uh, if you want to, well, you're listening to it, obviously. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for your support. And uh, we'll catch you next week. Peace.